Daddy's got all of me. I've got two girls at home. I was just talking to them a few moments ago. One of them is Rebecca. The other one, that's the older. The younger one, sister next to her, is Sarah. And they are about nearly five years apart. Some time ago, I was in a missionary meeting, come home late, and they're daddy's girls. And they, even now, Rebecca's a young woman, but she's still daddy's girl. And I love my children. And I remember uh, they would set up and wait. I wouldn't come in for months, and then when I come in, they'd wait to see me. Well, they were little. It's been several years ago, about 10 years ago. I'd been overseas. And I was coming in, and the plane was late. And so the little girls got sleepy and went to bed. The sand man got in their eyes, or throw the sand in their eyes, rather. So then, well, wife waited up, and finally I got in early around 3 o'clock in the morning. So then I was so tired and weary, I couldn't sleep. I laid down for about an hour, and I got up, went in the living room, sat down in the chair. And after a while, it broke day. And the first thing you know, I heard a noise back in the room. And as the two girls had, had woke up, and Rebecca woke up first. The idea struck her. Daddy's home. Here she come. Out of the bed and here she come. Well, that woke her little sister up. Well, I, I guess my children's like yours. Uh, when the oldest one wears something almost out, the next one gets the hand-me-down. So <laughs> Sarah was wearing Becky's pajamas, and that was the times that they had these kind of rabbit feet pajamas, great big feet in them. And they were certainly way too long for, for Sarah. And so she couldn't keep up. Her legs was too short. And so Rebecca ran in and jumped up on my knee and threw both arms around me and began to hug him. Of course, I had to cry a little. So, and poor little Sarah thought she was left out. Becky had beat her. So she was standing at the door, and her big black eyes looked up and the tears on her cheeks. So Rebecca turns around and said, Sarah, my sister, she acted something like I think some of the churches try to do, you know. Said, I want you to know that I was here first. <laughs> and she said, and she had both arms around me. And she said, and I've got all of daddy. And there's none left for you. Now, that's what they try to tell us a lot of times, you know. Well... Becky was kind of long-legged, and so she could reach the floor. She was pretty well established, you know, <laughs> like many of the churches. But uh, little Sarah, she was so hurt until I looked at her, and I winked my eye at her, you know, and motioned like that and stuck my other knee out. That's what she was waiting for. Here she come, and she jumped up on my leg and is a little too high for them short legs of hers and she was wiggling about like she's going to fall well i caught her with both arms she put her little head up against my bosom and she kind of liked the feeling i guess and so did i so i was hugging her she raised up and she looked up at rebecca and i thought this was pretty good she said rebecca my sister <laughs> I want to tell you something, too. She says, it may be right that you were here first and you got all of Daddy, but I want you to know Daddy's got all of me. So, <laughs> Kentucky produces some great men. I said to my little boy, I said, you know, Kentucky's produced some great men. said, for instance, who, Daddy? Billy. And I said, well, I said, Abraham Lincoln. He said, yeah. And I said, Daniel Boone. He said, yeah. I said, your dad. He said, oh, Daddy. <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I see it in Babylon. It's getting up in the daytime. Old king had said anybody that won't bow to that image will be thrown in the fiery furnace. His head hotter than the gospel tabernacle in Chicago. All right. It said it'd be seven times hotter than it's ever been hit. Ever who won't bow to that image. Well, these boys turned their back on him. Already said I'm going to throw him in the fiery furnace. 
I can look down at Babylon that morning. Amen. I can look, I can see the whole sky red. The king Nebuchadnezzar had himself a seat sitting out there, you know as it was, his legs crossed, said, bring out them holy rollers. <laughs> religion out of them. Brother, you can't make fire fight fire. The Holy Ghost is fire itself. That's right. Said, bring them out. And we'll burn that religion out of them. We'll make them bow down. I can hear Shadrach and the Meshach and the Abednego starting up that gang plank there going to drop off into the furnace. I can hear Shadrach say, Brother Abednego, yes, Shadrach, you sure you prayed through? Yes. I'm sure it's all right. Yeah, that's the victory. All right. He said, hey, you want to take it back? He said, our God is able to deliver us in this fiery furnace. But nevertheless, if you don't do it, we'll not bow down to your image. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yes. I'll not bow to your image. They walked a few feet farther. My, looked like God was unconcerned about it. I can see the man with the spears. The intense heat was just about to get them. It's about to suffocate. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, kind of fainty like, walking on up, hands tied behind them, going right into the fiery furnace, taking the last step of the way. I can see them now where they're just about, let's dramatize this a little. I can see them where they're just about one step from going into the fiery furnace. The only person gets in a hurry is you and I. God takes his time. As long as he's promised it, that's good enough. All right, I can see him right up there, almost ready to step in the fiery furnace. And look, it looks pretty bad for believers there. There the old king sat and said, well, we'll stop them holy rollers around here now. We got her all under the situation control now. As soon as they hit that fiery furnace, the rest of these guys will see that. They'll know that I'm boss around here. But brother, there's another boss that's up out in heaven who yeah. knows all things. Yeah. Let's turn our face towards him now and see what he's doing. You know, all the time there's anything going on down here, there's something going on up there too. Did you know that? Yeah. Let's look. I can see him sitting on his throne. My eyes, great robes hanging around him. I look coming up to his right. Here comes an angel. You believe his angels in heaven? Yeah. There's a great fellow come there with his sword drawn. His name is Gabriel. He stood up before the master, bowed his head, said, Master, I've tried to obey you ever since you created me. But have you looked down in Babylon this morning? We got three believers down there that absolutely are true, genuine believers, and they're fixing to burn them up. Let me go down there. I'll change that scene. I believe he could have done it. <laughs> Yes, sir. I can hear the master say, Gabriel, you're true. You've been a real angel. You've done everything I told you to do since I created you. But put that sword back in the sheath. I can't let you go. Hey, Gabriel sheathed his sword, stood attention at his side. Here comes another angel. What's his name? Is that Wormwood. He's got control over all the waters. He falls down before the master. He says, Master, have you looked down at Babylon? They're fixing to burn up three believers down there this morning. That's holding true to God's word. Look at him. Well, I tell you, if you just let me go like you did when I gave me the power to destroy the Andalusian world, I broke up all the springs in the deep and I sent a flood that destroyed the whole world. Woodworm in heaven, you'll ask control of the waters. He said, I'll go down there this morning and I'll wash babbling off the face of the earth. I believe he could have done it. Amen. I sure do. I hear him say, Woodworm, you're a good angel. You've obeyed me ever since I created you, but I can't let you go. But he said, Lord, have you considered? Yes. I've been watching him all night long. <laughs> Amen. His eye is on the sparrow. <laughs> and I know he watches me. Amen. Yes. I've watched him all night long. I heard him in the prayer meeting last night. I heard him when they prayed to and they struck heaven here with their prayers. I'm watching him. I know they got one more step to go. I've been watching them all night long. I can't let you go because it's a man-sized job. I'm going myself. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. I can see him rise from his throne. His priestly garments drop around him. Walk out here to the edge of his big throne. Walks out here. Over in there stands a big white thunderhead. I can hear him say, come here, east wind, west wind, north and south. Amen. <laughs> Everything obeys him. Say, get out of that thunderhead down and ride upside of my throne here. 
I see those winds get out of that thunderhead, big cloud of come war over for the throne. He steps off on there, reaches up, gets a hold of zigzag lightning, and cracks her. And winds are like horses. Brother, he was on his road down when they made their last step. When he passed by the sea of life, he pulled off a palm down there. By the time they tucked their last step into the fiery furnace, there was a fourth man in there, one like the Son of God, fanning away. He was like that. Why? Because somebody took God at his word. Hallelujah. A God with skin on it. God, all ages, has had skin on him. He, God has been hid behind a veil. It just reminds me of a, a little story that happened down in the south. And so there's a Christian home. And they, in this Christian home, they believed God, and they, they thought that uh, God protected them from all troubles, and which he does. And they had a little junior, a little boy about seven or eight years old, and, and he went to Sunday school and was a very fine little lad, but he was scared in a storm, especially when lightning was flashing. And I told this to a man the other day when uh, this piece had come out about this man being healed, this same minister said, they make a god out of you, Brother Branham. Well, he was a critic, so I thought I'd just let, kind of break it off just a little bit, not to hurt, you know, but just kind of, I said, is that too far from the scripture hmm? to be that? See, I said, no, it isn't. I said, because Jesus called prophets gods. See? That's right. God, and they say, well, you people try to take the place of God. That's not too far out. That's exactly what it is. Amen. It's exactly God manifested in flesh, Amen. just as he promised. Amen. This little family, we find, it. I told him this little story, which come to my mind just now, that one night it come up a storm, and mother said to Junior, said, now, you go on upstairs, son, and go to bed. He said, Mom, I'm scared. And he said, ain't nothing going to hurt you. Go on up and go to bed. Little Junior laid up there in the lightning flashing around the windows. And the little fella got so nervous, he sticking his head under the cover, and he could still hear the, the lightning, or the, see the lightning flash on the windows and, and hear the thunder roar. So he said, Mama. And she said, what do you want, Junior? He said, come up here and sleep with me. So uh, she come up the steps like any good, loyal mother would, and she came up and she took little Junior in her arms and she said, Junior, mother wishes to speak to you just a moment. I said, all right, Mama. I said, now you must bear this in mind. We go to church constantly. We read the Bible. We pray. We are a Christian family. We believe in God. And said, we believe that in storms and whatever goes on, God is our protection. He said, Mama, I believe every bit of that. But say, when that lightning's so close, he said, I, I want a God with skin on it. <laughs> so I, I think not only Junior, but all of us feel that way. When we get together, when we pray one for the other, God with skin on it. And we find out here that God has always had skin on him. When Moses seen him, he had skin on him. He looked like a man. When God was behind the curtains, he had skin on him. And God tonight in his church is veiled in his church with skin on it. He's still the same God tonight. Dead boy raised in Finland. I come down off of the Colpio Tower, and when I did, they were singing up there, and an Englishman from England, a buyer, was up there, and he was so drunk. And he heard that song on Golgotha, and all their songs are in minor. And when he came down, why, he was weeping. And we went over to him and talked to him. He could speak English, and we led him to Christ there on the hill. And Brother Baxter and them said, come on in now. Or not Brother Baxter. Brother Baxter wasn't along that day. Brother Lindsay. And he said, now, come on, let's eat. There's about 30 ministers up there. And I said, no, I can't eat. I don't want to eat until after 6 o'clock. We sat down, and I listened to them talk and everything through the interpreter. And I said to Brother Lindsay and Brother Moore coming out, I said, something's fixing to happen. I said, I just feel that, that something's going to happen. And I said, I don't know why. And we got in the cabs, and they don't have many cabs in Finland. Most of them are horse-driven. So we was coming down in a car, and down at the bottom of the hill, there was an accident that happened, 
and a car, an American-made 35-model Ford sedan, had struck two school children running at the speed of 60 miles an hour. And the two little boys are going across the street. There's not many cars, so they were, and they started this way. And they seen the car coming, and they started to run back, and one run this way and one this way, and the fender, the driver, swung to the right. And when he did, it hit the little boy by the chin over this way, and just turned him over and smashed him up the side of a tree and concussed his little head in that way. And the other little boy had knocked him straight forward as he gave the twist and run over him and mashed him under the wheels and kicked his little body up in the air when the wheels would set, he'd lost control of it and just threw down on his accelerator and instead of his brake and it just the little boy's body just rolled up like that and flew up in the air and went out in the street and fell like that. Oh, just mashed the little fellow. And we were way up on the hill, way away, and we seen the accident happen, and then people began to run from the school, and it was quite a little bit, about 15 minutes, till we got down to where the little boys were. And they'd done tuck one little boy. I didn't know there was but one of them. But uh, the other one, they'd done got him in another car and got him away, and there's no more cars there. And I drove up, or they drove up, rather, and Brother Moore, when he got out, he started weeping, come running back to the car, said, Brother Branham, and Brother Lindsay, here he come, he had a little boy too, and my Billy Paul, I hadn't seen him for a long time, and Billy's mother, you know, is dead, and I've been both mother and daddy both to him, and I, I pack him around with his bottle against my bosom here to keep it warm in the cold weather and crying, walking up and down the streets. You've read my life story. Like I don't know what to do, and the little bitty fellow leaning on my shoulder, and I, he's always scared when I go away. Of course, he's almost a young man now. But I thought of him. What if that would be him? And what if I'd, a telegram would come across the sea and say, Billy Paul was crushed in a car wreck and he's laying dead, wanting you to come home. And oh, how I begin to think how that poor mother, they'd gone after her. And there the little fellow laid there with a coat over his face. They said, come look at him. I couldn't look at that child. I just sat there and I was just shaking like that and Brother Lindsay just a holding his a breath like that and crying. He's got a little boy too. And so finally I took a look at the little boy just go to pick him up and we had to take him to a, a place. Now if I hadn't have been so excited, I'd have caught it right away. And as soon as I stepped out of the car, Mr. Eisen said, isn't that terrible? So then people said, there's that miracle worker from America. Let's see what he'll do on this case. And I said, well, it's just people who didn't understand. And the chief man of the city, I guess a, a guy like a mayor of the city, he was there. And so we, we went, I went over there, and they looked, and oh my, poor little fellow in there, his mouth open like that, his little eyes open, his little hands like this. And they would wear those little, I guess they used to call them little panty waist for boys, you know, and he had a big heavy rib stockings. And his little shoes was knocked off of his feet, and one of his little feet that was twisted up like this was run plumb through his little foot, run through his, his stocking at the bottom. Oh, he was uh, just a horrible in there, his eyes open like that. And I said, "Poor little fella," and that just made it worse. And I let's go to put him into the car. And as I started turning around, I looked in front of the little boy. I felt something go. I said, maybe that's just my sympathy for the little fellow. I started to make another step. Someone. I waited just a moment. I turned around. I said, let me see that boy again. And they pulled back the, the coat they had laying over him. I said, I've seen that boy somewhere. I said, that... Ask those ministers if he's been in the church, a member of their church. No. I said, has he ever been in the prayer line? Brother Lindsay said, no. I said, I've seen him somewhere, and I don't know where, but it still looks like. And I looked around, and I seen them big rocks piled up laying there. I said, praise God, I know where I saw him. <laughs> I said, Brother Moore, get your Bible. Brother Lindsay? So what's the matter, Brother Branham? I said, look at the folder of the leaf in your Bible. I said, that's the little boy that's going to be raising the dead. <laughs> and they, Brother Moore run over the car and got his Bible. He said, brown hair, brown eyes, about eight years old, poorly dressed, crippled, been um, mashed by accident, a rocky land. I said, Brother Branham, that's it. I said, that's him. 
Oh, my. You don't know how that feels. You know where you're at then. All devils out of hell. If he'd lie and everything, he wasn't hell up around and never stop it. It's there. It's got to happen. Now the only thing is just drama. I said, now I remember I knelt to this side in the vision when I prayed. You have to do just as you've seen it. And I knelt down. They all gathered around. I said, now watch. Thus saith the Spirit of God, this boy's life will return to him. And there he'd been dead, dead, taking his pulse and everything, he's gone. So, and all mashed up like that. And I knelt down, I said, Heavenly Father, many thousands of miles across the sea, and that lovely nation where I come from, America, I said, down there that night when you moved into that room in that lovely place and told me that this would be, and I've testified of it, and stood and said that you'd bring it to pass, and now thy servant sees the day that is to be fulfilled. I said, I thank thee, Heavenly Father, for the power of vision, and I thank thee for all your goodness, and now, eternal God, author of life and giver of all good gifts, I ask you to bless this scene with your presence. And when the angel of the Lord began to move down, I said, O oh, holder of this boy's spirit, death, according to a vision that God has already showed that you cannot hold this child, therefore I call for his little soul to return to him in the name of Jesus Christ. And no more than I said that, the boy jumped to his feet just as normal and well as he could be, just as perfect and normal and whole as he could be. That's wrote throughout Finland, everywhere. Killer bull. Some time ago, when I was on the warden force, near Henryville, Indiana, is a friend lives up there, and I he was sick, and I was turning some fish loose in a creek. So I thought I'd go over and pray for the man. So I had a little old gun you had to pack as a warden. I unbuckled the thing, throwed it up in the truck, and shut the door. And I thought I'd go across the field over to pray for my friend. As I walked up across the field, I was going along humming. I forgot that down at the Birch farm, a great big Guernsey bull had killed a colored man down there who was a caretaker. He was a fine animal, and they didn't want to kill him, so they sold him up here to this man. I know there was warnings all around the field, but I forgot about it. They got right out in the middle of the field where there's some little old scrub oak. I don't think you have in this country. And as I passed by this, all at once this big killer bull raised up. And he snorted. And I recognized that's the bull. I turned first. I felt for the gun. It wasn't there. I'm glad it wasn't. I'd probably kill the bull and then paid for it. I felt for the gun. It wasn't there. I looked to the fence. It was too far for me. There was no trees around for me to get into. There it was nothing but to face death. I said, well, Lord, if the time has come for me to die, I want to face it like a man. I shoved my shoulders down. I said, if this is it, if I must die by this bull, then I must die. And something happened. I know this sounds like a child. But it's the truth. Somehow or another, instead of despising that beast, I had a love for it. And I thought that poor thing was laying out there in the field. I come in on his territory. I disturbed him. He don't know more than to protect himself. And he threw his horns down and dug the dirt up, fell onto his knees. You know how they do just before they charge? And I thought that animal, oh, I'm so sorry that I disturbed you. I said, I don't want you to kill me. I'm the servant of God. And I'm on my road to pray for some sick people. And I forgot about those signs. I was talking just as I am now. But there was something that happened. I wasn't scared of him. 
I was no more afraid of that bull and I would be my brother. That's where the church is. You're always scared. It's not going to happen. That's the reason it don't happen. When that fear, love casts out fear. When you've got love, fear is gone. But as long as you got fear, love cannot operate. And when the bull made his charge to come to me, he come within about 10 feet and he stopped and threw his front feet out and he looked so depleted as he looked this way and that way. And he turned and went right back around and laid down over there where he got up at. I walked across the field and went out of the pasture. He just laid there and looked at me. It was love that took the fear away and God seen me through. Now, after I got out of the pasture and that left me, then I just shook like a leaf. But while I was in the presence of him, the fear had left. Shamgar and the Ox Code Shamgar! Many of you, he was one of the judges of Israel. One little, many ministers never even see that in the Bible. But he was one of the judges of Israel. One little verse wrote about him. But I like him. He's a man after my heart. You know, the Philistines and every man did what he wanted to do. So we find out the Israelites had raised up a whole lot of crop. And the Philistines had set back over there and gamble and let them slay for him. And here they walk right in, no unity among them. Go right on in and say, well, take their crops. Year after year, they did that. This little old fellow one day, he wasn't a, a warrior. He just had a, the only thing he had was his crop. I imagine standing there to put his crop in the barn. He looked at the little ragged kids and his wife needed to dress him. He just got it all laid in nice. And he was standing there, leaning, saying, well, maybe we can eat this winter. He heard something. He looked out the barn window. Here come a thousand Philistines. March, march, march. Great big plates of armor over him, big well-trained man, spears in their hands, march on earth, take what he had. He looked down at his kids. He looked at his wife. He was concerned. But what was he? He was helpless. He's not a swordsman. Now, he didn't say, now wait a minute, maybe I better go to school and learn how to duel the creeds. <laughs> If he had done that, that's all he knew about. <laughs> but here's one thing that he knew. He happened to think, by birth, I'm an Israelite. And God promised Abraham, my father, that his seed would possess the gate of his enemy. Hey, Amen. That's enough. Hey, Amen. He was concerned of his family. He was convinced he was an Israelite. The first thing he had in his hand, he grabbed it. <laughs> There's an ox goad, a stick, a little piece of brass on it, knock the mud off the plow, push the goad along, or the uh, goad the uh, ox as it went along. And a thousand Philistines with armor. He don't see the opposition. He was concerned and he was convinced. He was convinced to know that he was an Israelite. He was convinced that God couldn't lie. He was convinced that the blessing was up on him. He knew that it was a promise of God. Hey, man, I feel pretty religious right now. He was convinced that it was God's promise. Just the same as Acts 238 is God's promise. He was convinced that God said his seed, which he was, will possess the gate of the enemy. So he grabbed that ox goat and stood right out there and beat every one of them down. Huh? He was concerned and he was convinced. A Mother's Prayer for a Baby I don't have time. I just wish I could tell you little stories. Every time I think of it, I just have to pass it by. But I think this one will hold just for a minute. It was down in Meridian, Mississippi. Many of you won this people... Brother Bigby was holding, was sponsoring my meetings as a oneness brother. And one night in a meeting, Billy Paul had went over in the arena and to give out prayer cards. Oh, it was pouring down rain. And the people standing outside, umbrellas and things. And um, Billy gave out prayer cards. And there was a, 
And uh, then he'd come to get me. And while there was, while he's come to get me, there was a little lady that sat down in front and there was another lady walking with a little baby, trying to keep it quiet. And this little lady sitting there with a little calico dress on, whatever what it was, was a mother too. And she seen the lady and the Holy Spirit spoke to the woman, something on her heart, go pray for that baby. Well, she said, next time she passes, I'll go pray for her. And when she passed again, the lady was holding a prayer card. Oh, she said, I, I couldn't pray for that baby. She said, Brother Branham will pray for that baby tonight. And who am I to pray for the baby if Brother Branham's going to pray for it? Now, that was reverent. And that was nice. But that can't always be the will of God. Sometimes it's different. The Holy Spirit kept telling her, go pray for that baby. Finally, she thought, that woman would turn me down cold when she's got that prayer card. She wouldn't want me to pray for that baby. She brought that baby here not for me to pray for it, but for Brother Branham to pray for it. So the Holy Spirit kept saying, go pray for that baby. Finally, she said, well, to relieve myself, I'll just say, uh, uh, I'll give her my seat. So she said, honey, one little mother talking to the other. Would you, you got that baby? Said, would you come sit down here, take my seat? She said, oh, honey, I don't want to take your seat. Said, I'm trying to keep the baby quiet. Said, but you look so tired, more out. She said, I am. She said, well, sit down here and take my seat. And she said, I see you got a prayer card. Uh, perhaps your brother Bram's going to pray for your baby. She said, we hope this number will be called. And she said, well, I do too. She said, sister, uh, you are a Christian. She said, oh, yes. She said, I'm a Christian too. And said, ever since I've been sitting here, the Spirit of the Lord has been telling me, pray for that baby. Would you give me permission? I know Brother Bram will pray for that baby if it's called. And you just keep holding your card. He'll get it. said, but if I lay my hands upon the baby and just offer a little prayer to make myself feel better and get out from under that what's calling me would it would it offend you she said well certainly not darling pray for the baby and it was a little blue baby and so the the little lady prayed for it she gave the lady her seat and she climbed up into the third balcony and was standing up some christian brother up there gentleman enough to get up and give this lady a seat so uh, she sat down about a half hour later, I come into the meeting, spoke for a few minutes, called the prayer cards, and this woman was third or fourth in the line with that baby. And she sat there and she said, oh, thank you, Lord. Now, I felt so sorry for that little mother. I believe the baby will get well now because Brother Bram says the third or fourth. He'll get to that one. said, thank you, Lord. The little mother sitting up there feeling for that baby. All right. Then when I come up, I started praying for the baby. When the lady come up, so I looked at her. And said, now, your baby is a blue baby. You brought it here to be prayed for. And now, your name is Miss So-and-so, and you come from such and such a place. But the baby's already healed. There was a woman who had a burden on her heart by the name of Miss So-and-so that's sitting up here in a balcony, first one on the end of the fourth row in the third balcony, prayed the prayer of faith for the baby. And the baby's already healed. She just almost dropped out of her seat. See? Now, what if she had not have done that? See what I mean? Now, that woman would have more sympathy for that baby, a mother to a baby, than I would for the baby. See? And the mother being, see, can we all do miracles? Yes, when you're directed by the Holy Ghost to do miracles, go do it because it's Holy Spirit directed. Now, if that woman wouldn't have carried out what God told her, perhaps it had been a rebuke in the Spirit to her. You see? Amen. And should have disobeyed God. Always, if you are a Christian and something is persuading you to do something, go do it. Go do it. Don't doubt it. Go do it. Did you say this baby came from heaven? There's a lady who spoke to one of my associates here, Mr. Mercer, out in the camp. I've been out with her husband fishing. Brother Bosworth had told me a little joke. I told it to her husband. It was a simple little thing. But it's, uh, I, it's simple as I said a little boy was standing looking into the cradle where his little baby brother was. had just been born a couple days before that. And his feet were sticking up and his little uh, gums are hanging up like that. And he was a squalling like he's just boiling up a storm. And the little mother looked at the little fellow standing and he said, Mama, did you say this baby come from heaven? He said, yes, son. He said, well, no wonder they put him out. Well, that to me just was a little joke. Little bitty 
Sunfish. Brother Banks Woods, if you're listening in tonight, your brother was here last night. I seen him as it went out, Brother Lyle, Jehovah Witness. The whole group was converted. Lyle was brought in because of vision of the Lord. Lyle was sitting in the boat there that day when the day before was told him that something was going to happen concerning a resurrection of life. He was a real Jehovah Witness too. <laughs> but that morning sitting there fishing and he caught, well, he had a great big old, that Kentucky fashion, you know, a big hook and a little bitty fish swallowed it and he just pulled gills, entrails and all out, throwed it out on the water, a little bitty sunfish. And he said, a oh, little fellow, you shot your last wad, a little flipping along on the water, died and we blowed him up into some pond lilies. And the day before setting, I said, the Holy Spirit tells me that there will be a resurrection of some little creature. Perhaps there'll be a, a kitten when I get back home because just but when we're trying to dig some fish bait, Brother Woods and I was listening in tonight. My little girl, which is a young woman sitting here engaged to this lanky soldier, I said, she come up, she said, Daddy, her and another little girl said, we... Uh, anybody can have any kind of pet they want, but I sure don't like a cat. So she, or no Branham. So we, she said, oh, we found a poor old cat out here, Daddy. It's, um, it, it's eat something and it's, uh, somebody's poisoned it. It's all swelled up. Said, Daddy, it's going to die right away. Can we get a little box and keep it a couple days? And I said, let me see the cat. Well, they went and got the cat. I seen what was going to happen. So. We give her a box, and next morning about seven or eight kittens there, you know. So uh, my little boy, Joe, picked one of them up and squeezed it and dropped it on the ground, and just a just little fellow there wiggling around and around killed it. And I said to Brother Lyle, his brother, I said, you know, it may be that it be that little kitten raised up like we have seen the Lord do things. Brother Lyle just knew in the way. The Holy Spirit just told him, he was married and what he had done and the evils he had done, the things he had done. When he thought Brother Banks was telling me them things, but when it really brought him right out and told him what he'd done the night before, that was, that was too much for him. He couldn't get it. Then, the next morning while we fished all night with little fish, we was catching some for bait. But he just threw that little fish in the water, quivered, flowed over about a half hour later. We were sitting there and I, was, I said, Brother Lyle, you let the fish swallow the hook all the way down in his stomach, see? I said, take the fly line here, flip it over the bait out like that. As soon as he touched it, I said, then just hold him and then bring him in. I said, you don't pull him out like that. Don't swallow it. You catch the fish. He said, well, he had a great big old line hanging over. He says, this is the way we do it, like that. So just about that time, I heard something coming off the top of the mountain up there, a whirlwind whirling around and around. Here it come down like that, and the Spirit of God come over the boat. It said, stand up on your feet. It said, speak to that dead fish. It said, I'll give you back your life. And that little fish been laying there for a half hour with his entrails in its mouth and his gills. I said, little fishy, Jesus Christ gives you back your life. Live in the name of Jesus Christ. Flipped over on his back and down through the water he went as hard as he could go. Sick him, boy. I used to have an old dog who used to hunt with me, called him Fritz. He would take anything, tree anything in the world but a skunk. He just, he wouldn't go into him. He'd tree him in a brush pile and he'd go keep going around a brush pile barking. And the only thing I had to do to get him to go and get that skunk was just raise up the brush pile and pat him and say, Sick him, boy. Sick him, boy. He'd go in and get the skunk. Now, brother, every time I hear an amen is sick him, boy, and the biggest skunk I know of is the devil. Let's get him up a bush right now and go get him. Hallelujah. That's right. Yes, indeed. Sicky boy. Are you a writer? Remember one time my mother, they went west and she lived in Texas, Oklahoma. So my dad was a fancy writer. He really could ride and a very good shot with a revolver. And so he used to go to rodeos and things and he would ride he used to try to teach me to shoot a revolver. He'd take those big clay marbles and roll one out like that and had two revolvers and he'd take one, shoot under the marble and knock it up in the air and burst it with the other before it hit the ground. I couldn't hit a large can sitting still. So I, I know that I could never do that. 
but he could ride good. And so I always wanted to be like my dad. So we as kiddies on the farm, you know, and we had an old plow horse. And so of the evening after you get through plowing, I'd go down along behind the barn, had an old watering trough hewed out of a log. How many ever seen a watering trough hewed out of a log? Say, now we're coming home. Getting right down towards home now. And so I'd get all my little brothers and set them along out there on the side of the bank. And I'd get the old horse where Dad wouldn't notice it, you see. And I'd go down there and pick me a big handful of cuckleburrs and get the saddle and throw the saddle on the old horse and put these cuckleburrs up under there and pull down the hinges, you know, and climb up on him. Well, the poor old horse so old, you know, and stiff and tired, he couldn't even get his feet off the ground. He'd just bawl with them cucklebirds out there, you know. I'd sit there and take off my hat and say, I'm a cowboy. <laughs> Ride on this poor old horse, he'd just bawl, you know, and just jump like that. When I got to be about 19, I'd run away from home, going out west, I was going to be a cowboy. So I landed in Phoenix, Arizona, just in time of a rodeo. I went down to get me a pair of shafts and... When I buckled them on me, there's about 18 inches of leather laying out on the floor. I looked like one of these little band of roosters, you know, with them feathers. But I said, mm-mm, it's too long-legged out here for me. So I got me a pair of Levi's and went out to the stalls, and they let me in with a pair of Levi's on. So I was watching around. So after a while, they said this Kansas outlaw was going to be rode by a certain famous rider. I seen when they pulled, got that horse in that chute. I knew that that wasn't our old plow horse for a long way. They got him up in the chute like this. He had to catch his catch can when he come through. They opened the bull chute there to let him out. And when he did, this famous rider jumped onto the horse. And as they ju- he jumped onto the horse, that horse made about one buck, put all four feet, looked like, in a wash pan, and he could have thrown the saddle over the creel fence. And when that guy fell, when that horse threw him, the blood was running from his nose and his ears. The pickups got the horse and the ambulance got the rider. <laughs> So this fellow come by and said, I'll give anybody a hundred dollars who will ride him a minute. One minute. Anybody. And there was a whole big bunch of cow pokes sitting along on the fence, you know. I was sitting up there with him, you know. Boy, I thought I was a cowboy. And I've seen that. He looked, come right to me, the caller did, and said, are you a rider? I said, no, sir. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. I wasn't a rider then. When I got around where there's a rider at. Digging with a spoon. I didn't get anything when I was a kid. Mama used to get maybe one sack of candy and she'd measure it out, two or three pieces to each one. Maybe for Christmas we'd get a little tin horn or a little cap pistol or something. And I've seen other kids with sleighs and bicycles and things, good clothes and warm jackets. And I, I, I just made me feel so bad. I said, if I ever have any children of my own, I'm going to do everything for them I could. Well, I would be willing to go hungry to get something for my kids. And when I lived, when Billy was just a little boy, I'd get him a little tricycle and I'd get him everything and Meaty would try everything to sacrifice her own clothes and things to get him something. But you know what? We begin to find out I got him a little tricycle and a little bow and arrow and everything. I'd find him with a, a spoon or a stick out in the backyard digging somewhere. I said, the next ones won't be like that, see? You just give anybody everything right on their hand, they don't want it. It's something you have to sacrifice for. And that's the way salvation is. Amen. It's a complete sacrifice. Looks like a haint to me. I'm not telling jokes. I'm only making statements. I've come to one of our great Pentecostal moves here not long ago. I had a tent set up, and the pastor said to me, he said, my wife is the organist. I said, that's good, brother. Do you mind her playing? I said, no, no, sir, I sure don't. And he went to the manager, and the manager said, Brother Baxter, he said, that's all right. He said, Brother Brand, come over here, I want you to meet my wife. And um, I went over there, <laughs> I, I, please forgive me. See, I'm not trying to make a, a, a remark, I'm trying to make a statement, think. And the woman had one of these, your manicure, oh, I don't know, well, that stuff, you know, all fixed up in... Uh, I never seen such in my life. And a dress that was way down in here and no back in it and hardly any bottom in it. And I, I never seen such a look in my life. And she had great big earrings hanging down like this and a whole lot of stuff on. And I looked around and I thought, oh me. 
I'm a Baptist, and I know better than that. <laughs> I looked again. I said, oh, please, it's not a joke, but I had to say it to the brother, and I hope it helped him. Not saying to be different. If I did, I was a hypocrite. See, need to be cleaned up myself. I said, mister, did you say your wife was a saint? said, oh, yes. I said, she looks like a haint to me. I said, I, I never seen such a sight in my life as a minister's wife. That don't look like the wife of a holy man. And neither does the church of the living God, depending on her fashions, her tea parties and bunco parties and card games and dances and social, adorning herself like that with the world look like a holy God's bride. When she smokes cigarettes and dances and parties and soup suppers and cocktail drinking and all that kind of say they're the bride of Christ, it looked like a holy man's wife to me. No, sir, he wouldn't choose such a thing. He'd get a woman that was right. Looked like what he was trying to represent. I believe that's true. Simple Little Pigeon I want to tell you a little story that I read not long ago in closing. They said in time of the First World War, I had my father's older brothers, their, my cousins was in that war, many of them got killed. But in one place there, they had a, a whole regiment of soldiers, American soldiers pinned down. The German army had them pinned down. And the machine gun fire and the big cannons and whatever they had, mortar fire, whatever it was, had them pinned down. They couldn't get out. And there's no way of getting out. There's a whole regiment of soldiers perishing right there because it's on every side. They had planes. Darius and Sam went up to shoot it down. A man tried to get out. Well, this is every side. There was nothing. Their fine guns had failed. Their all their military strategy had failed. They were pinned in by the enemy. There was no way of getting out. There was nothing. And finally, one little soldier come up. He found a pigeon. One of those Homer pigeons. That was their only hope. They wrote a message and thought if this pigeon can only get through and back to the main headquarters where it come from can take this message, a message pigeon, messenger pigeon, and that's the only thing they had, a simple little pigeon. All the military things had failed, but they got a simple little pigeon. They wrote the message and tied it to his little leg and turned him loose with a blessing and a prayer that he'd make it. Of course, the Germans seen that white pigeon going up. They fired on it and everything else. One bullet went through its wing, knocked the feathers out. Another stripped around its neck, cut its craw off. Another one struck its leg and had the message on it. But the little pigeon kept flying, trying to get the message in. He must. There was life at stake. Finally, it was his struggles and flopping in the air and turning. And finally, he fell in the barracks or the camp where the soldiers was. One soldier picked him up and looked at him. This little fellow said he's been shot. He opened the looked at his little leg on his little bruised leg and there was a, a note they read the note it was covered with blood though it was covered with blood the message got through it got through they sent reinforcements quickly and saved the whole regiment of soldiers the little pigeon hadn't got through all them man would have perished what a disaster that would be it would have been a horrible thing and that was a great thing for that little pigeon to do Though it cost his blood, his blood was on the message. That was a great thing, but not half as great to one day when sin had sons of God pinned down. There was no hopes. There was nothing that they could do. All hopes is gone. But there came not a pigeon but a dove. 1900 years ago this afternoon, in simplicity, had been born in a manger, dying on a cross. But he reached heaven with the blood of his own self on the message, and he deliberated the sons of God. But now we can be again sons of God and daughters of God to live in holiness and purity, to live in his presence. I'm so thankful for that dove that came down from glory that took the message that I was in need, and he flew back to heaven with it. And it was bloody all over where the sins of the world had done but today, I'm liberated. I'm free. I'm so glad. Arnold Von Winkler The world tonight is looking for heroes. And it has heroes, physically speaking. One day, yonder in Switzerland, 
When Switzerland was at stake, the little Swiss party had gathered out into the fields to defend, defend their economy. The great oncoming army was too great for them. They were all trained, had big spears and shields. The Swiss could do nothing but give up. They were backed up against the mountain. Then there was a hero stepped out. Somebody had to die. And if they lost the battle, they had nothing but old sickle blades and rocks, sticks to fight with. When the oncoming army looked like a brick wall, if they were taken, their lovely little wives would be ravished, their young girls would be ravished, their babies would be killed, their heads would be busted, their homes would be gone, everything would be lost. Then there was a man whose name is too quickly forgotten by the name of Arnold von Winklard. He stepped out and said, Man of Switzerland, this day I give my life for Switzerland. He said, Just over the mountain yonder is a little white home. I've got a wife and three children waiting for me, but they'll never see me again. For this day I give my life for Switzerland. They said, what will you do, Arnold von Winkler? He said, follow me and do the best you can with what you have to do with. And he looked over the army until he found the thickest of the spears. Then he stuck up his hands in the air. He ran towards that big brick wall of spears and screaming, make way for liberty. Make way for liberty. A hundred spears turned to catch his charge. He threw his arms out and grouped them into his own bosom, which pinned him down, and he died on the end of those spears. Those Swiss followed him with clubs and sticks. That great display of heroism routed that army till the Swiss beat him out of the land, and they've never had a war from that day since. Stand up in Switzerland and name the name of Arnold von Winklard. You'll see tears run down their cheeks. Why? He saved the land. That was a great hero deed. It's seldom compared with and never exceeded in this earth. But oh, it was a little thing to what happened one day. When Adam's race stood, demons marching in from every side, prophets had failed, law had failed, Sacrifice of bulls and lambs had failed. Man's nature had failed. Everything and Adam's little race stood defeated, outnumbered by devils, superstitions, sickness, diseases. There was one stepped out in heaven and said, This day I'll die for Adam's race. He came to the earth and was made flesh. He looked right down where the midst of the spears was the darkest, the very darkest of all man's dreads was death. And he took death into his bosom and on Calvary. He paid the sacrifice and screamed, Make a way for liberty. And he screams to his church, Take this which I have left you, my blood and my spirit, and fight with over what you've got. We can conquer tonight through that, friend. You can drive the devil from you. Every old enemy that's in your life, it can be drove out by the blood and the Spirit of Christ. And you can stand perfect in his presence. Christ made the way. Dishwashing detergent. I'll tell you a little joke on myself. It isn't a joke. But you know, all of us love our wives, or we should. And I was looking at a program here some time ago out west. It's been a long time ago, about three years. And in my room, one morning I got up, and there was a television sitting in the room. And I thought, looked like bad weather. And I thought, well, at 8 o'clock they ought to have a news. And I got the little manual. It said news at a certain time. I turned the news on, and when I was hearing the news... Then I noticed that in the middle of the newscast, they broke off to advertise some kind of a goods, some kind of a detergent. And it said, you don't have to wash the dishes anymore, lady. 
The only thing you do is stick it right down the water and let it sit there a couple minutes, raise it right up and put it on the drain board. It's all over. I thought, I'm going to be a hero when I get home. I put the name of it down, this certain stuff. I said, I'll tell my wife, look what I can do. So I went and got a bottle of this such and such of stuff and I squirted it all in the water, told her to continue on sweeping the house. I fixed it up for her. So I got the children's plate and raked out the crumbs and so forth and the egg sticking on it and dropped it down in the water and let it set a few minutes and picked them out and set them up there. There's just as much egg on them as there was when I put in there. <laughs> See, I, I had a lot, my wife had lost confidence in me by that time. Mama, could anyone see God? There was an old fisherman lived down on that river. He was a deacon in my church. His name was Wiseheart, a very fine old man. And there was a certain Sunday school uh, in our city, a fine church, a great fine internationally known denomination of fellowship, fine pastor, and fine people. And there was a certain family in our city that went to this church, and there was a little boy in this family who got real enthused one day after hearing so many flannel graph uh, readings and so forth. He said to his mother, he said, Mama, if God is a great God as you say he is, could anyone see him? She said, Son, you should ask your Sunday school teacher. Mother's not able to tell you that. So... He went to the Sunday school teacher and he said, Teacher, I would like to ask you something. You tell me about great God. Said that's so great and he opens the Red Sea for the Israelites and he makes the sun to shine and he whirls the earth perfectly in time in its orbit and uh, so forth. Said, uh, could anyone see him? She said, that's too deep for me. You'll have to ask the pastor. So he got to the pastor and he said, Pastor, uh, could anyone see God? Said he's so great. I hear you speak from him from the pulpit telling how great he is. Said, could anyone see him? He said, no, son. No one could see him. Said, because you just can't see God. That's all. We just have to believe it. Well, the little fella, it didn't suffice us. So he, one day he was with the old uh, brother, uh, fisherman on the river, and they went up to what's called the Six Mile Island. It's six miles an island from Louisville, Kentucky, to this uh, island. They'd been fishing up there, and they'd caught a good catch of fish, and on the road down, there come up a storm, and there we have many storms, that, that wet country, lightning and thunder and great gushes of rain, and, and so after the, they had to go to the shore and get behind trees, and after the storm was over, they went back in their boat and started down. It was in the evening time, or the afternoon, rather, and the sun setting back over here in Tucson somewhere, it was reflecting its light in the sky, and there was a rainbow came out across the eastern horizon, and uh, the old fisherman was paddling his boat with his oars as everything fresh, the rain had washed the dust off, and it's a lovely time, and only a man who's used to the oars can appreciate that rhythm of the tipping of the oars as a boat glides its way through the water, his white beard hanging down, and he uh, kept watching that rainbow. And the little boy, enthused, looked around to see what the old gentleman was looking at, and he noticed the old fisherman, the crystal tears dropping off of his white beard. And the little boy sitting in the bow of the boat become so uh, enthused till he rushed towards the stern of the boat and said to the old fisherman, Sir, I'm going to ask you a question that my mother, nor my Sunday school teacher, nor my pastor could, could satisfy my longing to know something. He said, What is it, son? He said, Can anyone see God? And the old fisherman, so overcome by his, the little fellow's uh, question, pulled the oars into the boat and threw his arms around the little boy and the tears run down his cheeks. He said, God bless your little heart, honey. All I've seen for the past 50 years has been God. <laughs> See? Hey, you can get so much God on the inside that you can see him anywhere you look. Hey, 
But until that desire to see him, you won't see him. You can see him in the sunset. You can hear him in the call of the bird. You can watch him everywhere. He's on every hand. But the old man had so much God inside of him, he could see God everywhere. And I think that's kind of the way we ought to look for God, and we can see God anywhere we look. Stolen popcorn. I remember a little dirty trick that I done my brother there. Don't do anything wrong that you'll ever regret. I remember one day that Mama gave us some popcorn to take this to school with us. We couldn't eat with the rest of the kids. We'd always run over the hill there and eat because we, the rest of the children could afford sandwiches. And we used to have a little jar and there would be greens and a piece of cornbread laying on the side and two spoons and maybe a little jar full of stuff, you know, and we'd sit and both of us eat out of this jar with this spoon and eat our bread and pass it back and forth to one another. It was a shame before the children. And we'd run over the hill and eat behind the trees over there. I remember Mama getting us some popcorn around Christmas. We had a sack of it. We took it to school, left it in the cloakroom. And here's a little dirty trick that I did. I held up my hand. The teacher said, why do you want William? I said, may I have excuse? I said, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. And I went out the building. and went out through the cloakroom. I put my hand down that sack and got a great big handful of that popcorn. Went out and stood behind the school to eat this popcorn to be sure that I got my share of it. And I was eating that popcorn. I never will forget. When dinner time come, we went out and got our bucket and got our popcorn. My brother looked in that sack, about half of it going. He said, say, said, something happened there, didn't it? I said, sure did. And then, I know what had happened. I needed his popcorn. So, but he shared the rest of it. And standing there leaning over that fence, I thought of all those things. He's the one that's gone on. Big, fine, white robe. One day again in the monastery, they had an old saint down there, a bunch of young monks, and one of them kind of irritable. Watch this. Here's a good, a good parable today. He wanted to be something above the rest of them. He wanted to show himself authority, bigger something, something better. All clash, you know, and great big something. He had to be classical. Always wanted the other brother not, you know, he had to be different. See? He, uh, no matter what it was, he was very arrogant. He was the only pebble on the beach. There was nobody could touch him. Now watch what happened. He had to have something big. He had to compare with the, the big societies. You follow me? Yeah. Hey. So he said he prophesied. He said, the Lord's made me a prophet also. I'm a prophet. Now there was one identified prophet in the land, and that was St. Martin. He was born a prophet. But this kid said, young fellow said, young monk, about 25 years old, he said, the Lord has made me a prophet. Now I'm going to prove it to you. He said, tonight the Lord's going to give me a big fine robe. Put it up on me, a white robe, and set among you, and then all of you shall come up to me. See? And you'll take orders from me. Now compare that today. See? I'll be the head of the organization. I'll take care of you, the rest of you monks. And sure enough, that night, the lights come on in the building, so the writing of St. Martin says, read it. And it's authentic, it's history. And the lights come on, and all the rest of the Watched, and here come, he had on a white robe standing among them. He said, see what I told you? That's contrary to the word. And when he went and got the old dean of the college, he walked up and down a little bit. He said, son, that don't sound right. He said, there's only one way. Here it is. There's only one way for us to know it. looks supernatural. Boy, Pentecost would have grabbed that root, sinker, line, hook, and everything else. He said, the miracle may seem all right, but it don't seem right to the Word. Now we have such a person, an anointed prophet by the name of Martin. Come go up before him. The guy said, no, no, uh, Martin ain't got nothing to do with this. He said, you're going anyhow. <laughs> and they grabbed him by the arm to take him before Martin, and the robe left him. Amen. Hallelujah. See, deceive the elected, if it were possible. See? They know. Jesus said, my sheep know my word. Oh, you say, hear my voice. That's his word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. See? The predestinated knows this. A strange word or strange voice, they won't follow. That's the way those fellows back there, they wouldn't follow. They know that Martin was there, a prophet of that age, 
identified by God through the Word, know the Word, and that man wouldn't stand before it. Don't worry, little sister. This reminds me of a little story. I might say this just before closing. Down in Carlsbad, New Mexico, here they had the caverns there. You know, they got to go down about a mile down that. I never did like that stuff. They always like a mold in the ground. And it went down in there. And, oh, it gets midnight dark down there. And there's some little girl standing, oh, probably like that little thing there. And her little brother was standing over here uh, to one side with the guy that was taking them down. So they were standing down in this dark place, and there was light then, they had all the lights on. And this man, just for the guide, clipped over to the light, and this little boy was walking along with him, watching the guide. So the guy got over there and took this switch, and he just threw the switch off. Oh, my, talk about dark, a mile deep in the ground, you know, so dark you couldn't wave your hand, couldn't see anything. And that little girl was screaming for all that was in her. She was just jumping up and down, screaming, screaming as hard as And out of all the scream, the little boy standing over one side, he said, Oh, little sister! Oh, little sister. She said, what do you want, little brother? He said, don't be scared. There's a man here that can turn on the lights. Amen. There's a man here that can turn on the lights. He, he Jehovah Jireh. He, there's a man here that's among us tonight. The Holy Spirit, he can turn on the lights. He is the word. Me sick. I remember one in Phoenix, Arizona, Billy was going down to give out prayer cards. And he'd just stand there and give out prayer cards. And then people was able to run up there and grab the prayer cards. While the, the well people really had a headache, toothache, something wrong with the toe. They got, they got the prayer cards, Brother Ruddle. And when, when they did, then in a prayer loan, the only thing I got is somebody with a headache. Somebody had something wrong with the toe and uh, something like that. And there was people sitting there dying with cancer and things. They didn't get the prayer line. I said, Billy... Go down there and ask those people what's wrong with them. And if they haven't got cancer or some horrible disease or something that's going to kill them, don't give them that prayer cards. Get them people up there in that prayer line. It's, going, it's ready to die. If not help from the Lord, let them others just wait. Let them come in a fast line or something. But let them people that's ready to die. I said, ask them. He said, well, you said just shuffle up the cards and give it to them. That's what I was doing. I said, but you're getting them people right up there ahead of them. And they get them poor cripples and things can't get them. All right, I'll do it. He goes down. There's an old Indian, and they're very odd. He wouldn't sit down in a chair. They'd give him a chair, but he'd sit down on the floor in the tent. He had a hat on. He wouldn't take it off. Had a feather sticking in the back of it, just sitting there. Billy walked up to him, and um, he passed by, and he said, uh, You want a paracart? Hmm. He said, What's wrong with you, chief? He said, Me sick. He said, But what's wrong with you? He said, Me sick. He said, But I want to know what's wrong with you. He said, Me sick. That's all he could get out of him. He said, all right, I'll be back after a while. So Billy went along asking people. <laughs> the old Indian kept watching that prayer guards getting thinner and thinner. Every time he'd draw them out of his pocket, they were a little bit thinner. So after a while, the old Indian got up and walked over and tapped Billy on the back <laughs> to remind him <laughs> he was in this too. And he said, he said, uh, Chief, what's wrong with you? He said, me sick. <laughs> he said, well, Chief, you have to tell me. Daddy said not to give these cards to people that just had, uh, like, tummy ache and headaches and things. Give them to people who's real sick. He said, how sick are you, Chief? He said, me sick. <laughs> he sat him down again, and before he, his cards is really about gone. A couple of minutes, he kept watching them cards. He come back and tapped him again. He held out his hand. Billy put the card on his hand and said, Chief, go right on there, me sick. <laughs> He got in the prayer line, and I was praying for him, and I said, do you believe, Chief? He said, at right. <laughs> and I said, well, you believe that God will heal you? He said, at right. <laughs> I said, you can be a good boy? He said, at right. <laughs> I met him about a week later. Brother Fred Soppin, I believe, was there. It's when the, and when the tent meeting was going on. It's Phoenix. And I met him a little later on in the week. I said, are you doing all right, Chief? He said, at right. <laughs> Come to find out, I talked to, what was that missionary's name up there, that old man with the white mustache? <laughs> up there to the Apaches. I can't think of his name. Oh, he's a fine old fella. His wife has healed cancer, you know. He said, Brother Bram, that's all he can say. <laughs> he 
said I told him to say me sick, and the only thing he could say is at right. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's about it. See, at right, me sick. Somebody told me he uh, had one one time, was converted, received the Holy Ghost, and he said to him, how you get along? He said, pretty good and pretty bad. He said, well, how do you mean pretty bad and pretty good? He said, well, since me received the Holy Ghost, he said, there's been two dogs in me. <laughs> and one of them, a black dog, one of them a white dog. He said, they argue all the time. <laughs> he said, they growl and fight at one another. He said, the white dog wants me to do good. The black dog wants me to do bad. He said, well, chief, which one of them wins the fight? He said, that depends on which one chief feeds the most. <laughs> so I think that's a good answer here. See, there just depends on the warring of the body that's in you. It depends on which one you cater to, which nature you cater to. The carnal nature after the things of the world or the spiritual nature after the things of God. That does it. Stolen sugar. I tell you, the second thing I ever stole in my life, and the only thing I know of, was a handful of brown sugar from my daddy. They had some brown sugar in a box and made molasses for breakfast. Did you ever eat brown sugar molasses? Oh, my. <laughs> so I'm going home with some of these for dinner. <laughs> I went in, and my brother said to me, he said, if you go get the sugar, I'll get the cracker. I said, all right. Mother and dad were pouring in the garden. And I went in and got a big handful, enough for both of us. I was walking out that, you can't even look straight when you're telling a lie, you know. So I was walking along like that down along the garden all the way I had to get out. And Dad turned around and said, where are you going, William? I said, sir. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm going down to the barn. And he said, what you got in your hand? I thought, oh. I changed, I said, which hand? He said, come here. Oh, my. <laughs> I didn't want to wear sugar for a long time. <laughs> but sure tasted good, old. I'm talking about the sugar yet. <laughs> well, my father gave us a whipping. He had a, a razor strap made out of a piece of belt leather. Oh, my. I, and he had up over the door the golden rule. And it had all ten commandments on it. It's out of hickory. <laughs> a limb about that long. You know, ten branches out on it. We got our education out in the woodshed. Just run around Dad as hard as we could go like that. Billy sees Angel. We was in the hotel, and I was been praying, and I was almost asleep. And I woke up, and I knew he was in the room. I couldn't tell from where he was coming, but I waited a few minutes, and I knew it was coming over this way, coming across towards the bed. I got out of the bed, and my brother and my little boy was next to me and another bed, and I felt it coming, and I got out, and I knelt down the floor and started praying. He got real close. I never heard no voice or nothing. I waited a little bit. He got closer. Then I kept speaking, what would the Lord have me to know? And a voice began to speak in the room and told me not to do that, not to do that. And just my commission was to pray for the sick and not to do that. And then when I opened my eyes, there he was, just above the bed, whirling around and around. And I said, do, do you mind if my brother and little son could see you? And he never made any answer back. He's done leaving me, the anointing, I see it right off from me. And I kept my eye on him, and he never answered me, so I thought maybe he didn't care. I picked up a pillow and threw it over on the bed, and it woke up my brother. He said, what do you want? I said, wake up, Billy. And he said, Billy, your dad wants you. And as soon as he looked back, he let out a scream. He saw it. And he began screaming, and my little boy jumped over to bed with me and began hugging me around the neck, saying, Daddy, Daddy, don't let that get me. Don't let that get me. I said, well, honey, that ain't what, that won't hurt you. I said, that's the angel of the Lord that leads Daddy. Billy's an orphan. His mother died when he was just about 18 months old. And he's a little orphan child. And I've been daddy and mother both to him. And sometimes in going away, the little fellow used to stand at the airport and cry and go on. He said, Daddy, don't leave me. He said, what have I got on earth but you? He said, Mother's gone and everything. And said, if, if something happens to you, what will happen to me? 
So that's not easy to leave your children like that. But Jesus said, Whosoever will not forsake his everything and follow me, not worthy to be called my disciple. No matter what we do, we'll never be worthy to be that. But we like to do our part. So after that night, a little boy was consoled, and when he got to see the angel of the Lord for the first time, he never worried no more when I left. Ducks know their leaders. God in nature. God give that little bird nature. He believes in it. He, he trusts it. Here not long ago, I was up in Canada, and there was them ducks up there, up there on the pond, how they milling around on the pond. They'll be there now in about, Lord willing, in about another month, I take a hunting trip there. That little ducks come out of the south, way down in Louisiana, and Alabama, Texas, the rice fields, and they fly all the way into Canada, and they have their little ducklings up there on those marshes swamps or, or lakes. Now here's a little drake. He was born right there on that lake, born that spring. He's never been off of that pond. That's all he knows, born right there. But one night there'll come a, a white cap across the mountain up there. There'll be snow strike that mountain. That cold breeze will sweep down through the valley. That little drake will get right out there in the middle of that pond stick that little honker up in the air and honk four or five times and every duck on the pond will come right to him. Yeah. Why? He'll raise right off of that pond and go without a compass or anything else just as straight to Texas as he can go to the rice field. Yeah. If he stays any longer, it'll freeze over. They'll die. He's never been off of there. How does he know where to go? He trusts in the God-given instinct. Yeah. And if a duck has got sense enough to get away from danger and coldness, how much ought the church, by the power of the Holy Ghost and the resurrection of Christ, to get away from a dying creed? See what I mean? Instinct. Mexican baby raised to life. Last summer down in Mexico, where twenty something thousand came to Christ in one night. I was standing on a platform, many times wider than this, and the people come at nine o'clock at morning to stand there at the bull ring, waiting till eight that night when it got there. No place to sit down. They just leaned against each other. They wanted to go to church. And when we got in that night, the night before the Lord had performed several miracles, there'd been a little baby that had been brought up and Billy Paul, about 30 ushers, couldn't hold that little woman out of the line with that baby. She claimed to die that afternoon. It'll be published soon now because it's authentic. Brother Espinosa just got it for me and confirmed it. It has to be for the doctors and so forth or we can't publish it. So then the little woman screaming and Billy come to me and said, Daddy, you'll have to do something. That woman hasn't got a prayer card. And I'll give all those ushers orders not to get anyone in the prayer line without a prayer card. And said, there she is down there. She's whipped every usher down there. Just a little bitty woman climbed over the top of her thing, a blanket wrapped under her arm. And I said to Brother Moore, Brother Jack Moore, many of you remember him, he shared with me before. I said, Brother Moore, go down and pray for the little baby or console her some way because it wouldn't be right for me to go down there if the woman has got a prayer card. And as I started to look at my audience again, I saw that little baby out in front of me. The love of that mother. See what it had done? It had acted before God. Her love for the baby. And I said, just a minute, Brother Moore. I shall go down. And I walked over there and I told the ushers to let her through. And she come, fell down. She said, Padre means father. She's Catholic. I said, stand up, stand up. She got up, 
she motioned to her baby. It was raining all along. The little blanket she had around it was wet. I never looked at the baby, but I just said, put my hand on the little feller. And I said, God, it was under the blanket. Thou hast shown a vision of this little Mexican baby. That mother's love has touched you in some way. And about the time I said that, the little baby let out a big squeal and started screaming to the top of its voice. Women fainted and everything. That little baby was restored back to life by Jehovah God who felt the love of that mother pressing for her baby. Certainly it was. Suntan with a barrel slap. Walk down on the beach there and there, they damn women profess they have the Holy Ghost laying out there stretched out before man in bathing suits. Hmm. Brother, this might make you vomit, <laughs> but let me tell you something. I've got a girl coming on my cell. I said, what are you doing, lady? I said, is now your father a minister? She said, yes, sir. I said, well, see, I'm getting a suntan. I said, if my girl ever stretches herself out like that, she's going to get a suntan, but it's going to be Charlie Branham's son, give her a tan with a barrel slat and bring her home. That's right. I'd tan her. She'd, she'd remember it a long time, too. Blind John Ryan. Old John Ryan. Not the R-Y-A-N or R-H-Y-N. That was the blind beggar in Fort Wayne. There where we went that day and he was prayed for in the meeting. That was the night before the piano played the great position. Now he's near without anybody by it. And when he was blind, he's Catholic by faith and he, he stopped in the line and I looked at him and I said, your name is so-and-so, John Ryan. Yes, you're a beggar on the corner. You've been blind for years. Yes, that's right. You're Catholic by faith. That's right. I said, thus saith the Lord, you receive your healing. He said, thank you, sir. I said, thank the Lord. He said, but I can't see. I said, that has nothing to do with it. You are healed. And he said, uh, he went down along to help him off the platform. The natural man couldn't see nothing. They couldn't see no results from that at all. Well, I said, he's just as blind as he ever was. So two of his friends brought him back and put him in the prayer line again and run him through again. Howard let him pass through. When he come back again, he said, Mister, you told me I was healed. I said, you told me you believed me. He said, I do believe you. I have no reasons not to believe you. He said, you've told me all things in my life. And he said, I don't know what to do. He said, there was a woman back there testifying and she had a garter a few minutes ago and it's gone away. I said, then if you believe me, why are you questioning me? I'm telling you the word of God. He said, what must I do, sir? Knowing he was Catholic and had to have something physical that he could hold you. I said, just keep testifying. By stripes I am healed. And give him praise. The old man for the next two weeks or three, he stood on the corner and he sold papers. He would holler, extra, extra, praise the Lord, I'm healed. Extra, extra, praise the Lord, I'm healed. When he come back to the meeting the next night, I couldn't hardly preach for him. He'd raise up and holler, everybody keep quiet. Praise the Lord for healing me. Praise the Lord for healing me. As a Catholic, he didn't know how to take a hold of faith, but he knew if he kept on saying it, kept on, kept on, kept on. Until that six cents would go to work. That's right. Praise the Lord for healing me. You stand on the corner and praise the Lord for healing me. Extra. Praise the Lord for healing me. And he walked down the street and there's somebody come out and say, How are you, John? Praise the Lord for healing me. All right. And they laughed at him and made fun of him. And another little newsboy led him over to the barber shop for a shave about two or three weeks later from the meeting. And the barber put him up in the chair and lathered his face. And he said, John, he said, I understand some little smart aleck. And he said, I understand that you was down to see the divine healer. He said, yes, I went down. He said, I understand that you got healed just to make fun of him. And the old man said, yes, 
Praise the Lord, he healed me. And his eyes come open. Out of that barber chair, he went with a towel around his neck. The barber trying to catch him with a razor in his hand. And down the street they went. Ah, God's word had went to work. Eagle in the Barnyard. I heard a story one time that there was a farmer that was going to set a hen. Now I guess all you people know what it takes to make a set an egg. And he liked one egg and having enough. And he put an eagle's egg under the hen. That's about the way it averages, one to a setting. But <laughs> however, when this little fellow was hatched out, he was a stranger in a strange land. <laughs> That's why when some of these places hatch out an eagle once in a while. Amen. He didn't know what to do. He didn't, couldn't understand their language. The hen would get out there and scratch in the barnyard and all her cluck, 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 cluck. The days of miracles have passed. There's no such a thing as divine healing. All that Holy Ghost stuff is fanaticism. He couldn't understand that. He's kind of by himself. And he looked around and thought, is this where I belong? Now, I don't look up that way because that was one time, but we're down here now. See? But he couldn't understand that. He looked up and looked pretty good to him. Why? It was his nature. He was an eagle to begin with. He wasn't at home. Did you ever see any of them like that? I was one of them. So then the first thing you know, the clucking of the hen, he couldn't understand it. The chickens, their diet and the way they'd eat, well, he couldn't understand that. It turned his little stomach to see the way they eat. Sometimes it does a real Christian in an old formal church. The diet, bunco games, card parties, soup suppers for the preacher. God don't endorse that. So then the first thing you know, one day while he was out there running along by himself, looking around, his little wings folded, didn't know what to do, and all the little chickens just eating away on their diet. He couldn't understand it. But there come an old mother eagle through the sky hunting for him. She flew over. I'm so glad that he found me one day too. I never found him. He found me. I know there was something somewhere. There was something in my heart when they told me that visions and things was of the devil. That divine healing, that was just mental conditions. There was something down there that told me different. I know that was wrong. The old mother eagle flew by and she looked down and she saw her child. And she screamed. And when she screamed, he understood that language. She screamed, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That little eagle said, that sounds right. She come back across again. She said, son, you're not a chicken. You're a mine. I'm so glad. Hallelujah. You're my child. You don't belong among them chickens. She looks again. Could I be mistaken? I'll test him. God always tests his children by the word. And she screams back. And she said, if you are an eagle... And you believe. How I get out of here, Mama? Only thing you do is just jump and start flapping your little wings. They'll pack you. Jump, run towards the altar, and flap that little faith you got a little bit. See what it'll do for you. If you're sickly and they're dying, just make a run towards Calvary. Use that faith you got. Watch what happens. He made a jump. See, because he was an eagle. Now, if he'd been a chicken, he'd said, you'll never get me hooked up in that bunch of holy rollers. You'll never get me in that fanaticism. Oh, no. But he was an eagle, and he minded the word. And he, man, that's a Christian. When the Bible says anything, he'll say amen to it. Because the Holy Ghost that gave him birth is the one that wrote the word. He began to flop his little flappers. And he jumped up as hard as he could. He didn't care what it looked like, holy roller them chickens or not. He was obeying the word that was told him. And he jumped. 
and he started flapping his little wings, and he got his feet off the ground. Felt pretty good. Then he lit right on a barnyard post, right in the middle of a Pentecostal organization who fences all the chickens in and says, don't associate with that bunch. We got him. And his mother come back. She said, son, you'll have to jump higher than that or I'll never get you. That's the way it is, brother. You've got to jump into the arms of God. You've got to get off your feet. You've got to get off the denominational porch. You've got to throw your arms out to every man and woman that professes Jesus Christ to be a son of God. Certainly, love them. Break down your barriers. Don't fence them in. Eagles can fly, fence. She caught him. Oh, how good it was. Take, take the first solo fight up into the air because he was an eagle. Mother dear. Just a little story for closing. How many in here is hunters? Let's see your hands. My brethren in here, oh my, I know I wasn't alone. So I love to hunt. And I, I used to go up in the north woods up in New Hampshire. It's the home of the white-tailed deer. How I love to hunt them. And I used to go up every year, and I had a partner up there named Bert Call, one of the finest men I ever hunted with. And my nature has always been to the woods. I was born in the woods, and I just seemed like I was raised up there. Even my conversion never took it out of me. Not so much to get the game, but just to be in the woods. I think God is there. To see him, how he moves, and the nature, how it dies, and goes down, and comes back again. And resurrection. The sun comes up of the morning, a little baby born. And then about 9 o'clock it goes to school. About 10 o'clock it's finished. At 12 o'clock it's in its strength. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon it's getting along. Uh, about my age at five o'clock it's 80 years old it's dying it goes down it served god's purpose it ain't dead it'll come back the next morning it's god testifying there is a life death burial resurrection what's them trees out there last fall the sap went down into the root before any frost or anything else come what was it doing going down into the grave what happens then comes back again in the spring. It isn't dead. It goes down and lays in the ground, comes back. If it stays up, then the winter will kill it. See, God has no intelligence of its own, sends it down there. It's God's provided way. Yes. So it just follows God's provided way. It goes down, hides the winter, comes back again with new life next year, testifying there is a life, death, burial, resurrection. Everywhere it's the same thing. God, in his great creation, testifying of himself. This hunter is a fine shot, a good shot. But he was the most cruelest man I ever met. He, he'd make fun of me all the time. He shot fawns. Now, not it's wrong to shoot a fawn if the law says so. But, you know, Abraham killed a calf and fed it to God. So it wasn't the, the sect or the, the size. It's the attitude. He'd shoot him just because it made me feel bad. And he'd say, oh, you're chicken-hearted like the other them priests. said, Billy, you'd be a good hunter if it wasn't you as a preacher. And said, but you're too chicken-hearted. That's the way them preachers said. They're, they're too chicken-hearted. And I said, Bert, you're cruel. And he had eyes like a lizard anyhow. And he said, he did he, like the women try to paint their eyes, you know, up like that. And he said, and he looked over like that. And he said, you're just chicken-hearted. So he'd shoot those little pawns and kill one, let it lay, and go right on and get another one just to make me feel bad. He said, I'll get you away from that preaching some of these days. And I said, no, oh, no, bro. No, no. So one day I went up there one fall and it was late. And a season had been in about a week and I was busy. I was a state game warden of Indiana and I, I'd been busy and right in hunting season. So I had to get my vacation. I went up a little late. And uh, those white-tailed deer, if they're ever shot at, you talk about Houdini of being an escape artist. My, he's an amateur to them. And so then they really stay hid. And it had been moonlight nights, snow on the ground about six inches, good trailing uh, work. So Bert, when he come down to the cabin where I was at, he said, say, Billy, I got a good one this year for you. And I said, what? Reached down his pocket and pulled out. He had a little whistle. He'd blow it, and it sounded just like a little fawn crying for its mother. A little baby deer, no crying for its mother. I said, Bert, how cruel can you be? I said, you mean you wouldn't do a thing like that? He said, ha ha, you chicken-hearted preacher. And uh, we went on hunting that day, and we went up over the Jefferson Notch, and 
You didn't have to worry about him. He knew how to find his way back. So we climbed up to about noon and then we'd separate and go one one way and one the other. And then if we got our deer, we'd hang him up and, and then we'd get our horses and go get him. So we got about 11 o'clock. We hadn't even seen a track, not one track. All the deer were laying down. They'd get in the brush and under the brush piles and things where the tops of the trees where the loggers had been. And they would uh, they was hide and stay away because they'd been shot at. They were scared. About 11 o'clock, birds stop, sit down. There's a little opening about all oh, size of this building and he's inside maybe twice the size. A little opening there and he sat down. And he reached back to get, I thought his, his thermos that he had in his coat. We usually carry a thermos and have some hot chocolate uh, because it's got fuel to it, you know, and, and then have a sandwich. Now we separate. We was getting up high towards Timberline, so I thought maybe that Bert was going to have his sandwich. So he sat down to pull out this thermos and uh, I thought he was going to pull it out. And I just let, set my gun down against the tree and started at your mind. But what he was, he was getting that little whistle out. So when he got this little whistle out, he blew it. And anyone ever heard a little old baby fawn cry? It's kind of pitiful anyhow. And when he blew that whistle, to my surprise, right across from him, a great big mother doe stood up. Now, the, a doe is the mother deer. So she stood up. There was her big brown eyes and these, these big ears pointed right up like that. See, her baby was in trouble. And he blew it again. And she looked around. And she walked right out into that opening. Now that's unusual. Any of you hunters know that for a deer to do that. She walked out there. I could see her big eyes. She wasn't standing over 20 yards from me. And I thought, oh, Bert, you can't do that. And it killed that poor precious mother. Her looking for her baby and you deceiving her like that. And this whistle had blown and she was... She walked out there, and the hunter raised the lever on his 306 rifle, dropped it down, that cocked the gun, you know, with the safety off. And she heard that, and she looked around, and she saw the hunter. Her ears peeked right down. Usually they'd been gone, and she would have walked out there in the first place at that time of day. But you see, she was a mother. There was something in her, she, something genuine. Something she wasn't putting on no show. She was a mother. She was born a mother. And her baby was in trouble. And that was to her interest. And he looked up at me with those lizard looking eyes and grinned. I said, Bert, don't do it. Don't do it. He just grinned, turned around that rifle. Oh my, he's a dead shot. And I know when that scope hair come across her, loyal, motherly heart, he'd blow it plumb through her. See, she was standing 20 yards, big 180 grain, green, 180 grain mushroom bullet in there. He would just blow her heart plumb through both sides. I thought, how can you be so cruel as to blow that precious mother's heart out of her and her seeking her baby? How can you do that, Bert? I was thinking to myself. I seen his arms study down. I couldn't look at it. I just couldn't do it. I turned my back. I, I couldn't see that. That genuine, loyal mother standing there. She wasn't a hypocrite. She wasn't just putting it on for a sideshow. She was a mother. That's what she's doing. Death didn't mean nothing to her. The baby was in trouble. She thought more of her baby than she did of her own life. Let the hunter shoot whatever it was. Her loyal heart was beaten. Her motherhood, the motherhood in her was calling. Her baby was crying. There was something inside of her pulsating. It was real. And how could that cruel hunter blow that loyal heart out? I just couldn't see it. I turned my head. I thought, Lord God, don't let him do it. I was standing like this. I couldn't hear. I didn't want to hear the gunfire. It was just too much. I waited. The gun never fired. I turned around looking. It's going like this. He couldn't do it. He turned around and looked at me and those big eyes had changed. Tears was running down his cheeks. He looked at me and his lips quivering. He threw the gun on the snowbank and grabbed me into a trouser leg. He said, Billy, I've had enough of it. Lead me to that Jesus you're talking about. <laughs> there on that snowdrift, I led him to the Lord Jesus. Why? He saw something real. He'd been to all kinds of churches. He's seen something that wasn't put on. He's seen something that was genuine. Friends, 
We might have church rules and church regulations and theologies and everything else, but there's a real genuine Jesus. The Bicycle Race Mr. Baxter once, Ern Baxter, used to manage the campaigns for him. He said up in Canada, they were one time there's a contest to win a new Schwinn bicycle. They had a board that was a foot wide. They had to ride it for 50 or 100 yards, sitting about three foot in the air. And every one of them there were champions. Ern said I could go downtown, get my mother's groceries, put them under my arms, and come through the streetcars, up around the cars, and never touch my handlebars. Said I could ride, set backwards on it, ride the same as a good father. Said it didn't make any difference to me. And nearly all of them are champions. And they were sure they was going to win that swing by second. They had one little sissy fellow among them. He wasn't too good a rider. They know he wasn't going to win. But when they put them all on the track and started them out, every one of them fell off of this one little sissy boy. And he rode around to the end, got off, received the reward, tucked the bicycles, and all the fellows got around and said, Tell us how you done it. I said, boys, I'm going to tell you where you made your mistake. I said, I thought it all out before it got on there. That's a good idea. He said, you see, you all were trying like this to keep the bicycle on the board, looking right down like this at your bicycle. It made you nervous. You got to wiggling, you fell off. And I seen where you made your mistakes. He said, I never looked what was down here. I just watched the end and kept steady. That's it. That's it. Watch the end and keep steady. Just keep moving on. I'd be discouraged tonight. If it wasn't for that, I'm watching the end. Just keep it steady. Move on. No matter what takes place, just keep, don't look at that. Just keep looking at the end. That's where you meet God down there at the end. That's where the rewards are given out. Don't drop off here. Go on to the end. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Scripture. Brother Branham and the Three Bears. And this morning it kind of reminds me of a little, a little story that I, I like to hunt and fish. That's one of the reasons I'm here in Arizona, so is uh, getting hunting and fishing, and I like it. And so I was fishing one time in New Hampshire, and I guess I got a lot of partners in here that like to fish, both and the male and female too, they, we all like it. So I had a little pup tent I'd packed way high above where, you know, the fellows, kind of a little heavy or something, couldn't walk up there. And there's many fine of those uh, brook trout, brown square tail cutthroat, all oh, they just full of them little tributaries coming down out of the top of the mountains in New Hampshire. And a little trout, maybe 14, 16 inches long, just many of them. And I'd only... I go over there and catch them just for the fun of catch them, turn them loose. If I kill one, then I, I eat that when you see, bring them in. So I had a, some of this old moose willow growing up, and, and every time I'd switch my fly line, I had a little royal coachman that'd fly back in there with it. I'd switch it around a, a bunch of moose willow. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to take a hatchet and go up there this morning and, and chop that moose willow down so that I won't catch my line on it. Oh, I looked back under a little old like a beaver dam, and they were just laying in there just waiting for that coachman to get on there. And I, all night long, I used to say got my hair, but I, I ain't got enough hair for me to get into now. So I, I just, just how they, how they would watch him. And so I got up there that morning, took this little old hatchet and cut down this moose bullet. And I had three or fours go to fix for breakfast and come back. And I'm not a very good cook. And so um, I told my wife I couldn't boil water without scorching it. So, you know, that'd be pretty bad job of cooking. So on the road back, there'd been an old mother bear and two cubs, and they'd got my little tent. And you talk about rim wrecking something. You don't know how things can be rim wrecked till you let a bear get in a tent. It, they, it's not what they destroy. What they eat, I mean, it's what they destroy. I had a little stove, a little sheep herder stove in there. And um, they'd get on this little stove and just jump up and down to hear the pipe rattle and just mash it to pieces, you know. And when I come up, I had a little old rusty 22 rifle laying in there, but I had a, this axe in my hand. And, you know, when I come up, the old mother uh, run off to one side and she cooed to her cubs. One cub followed along all right, but the other one said, little bitty fella may, you know, just come out. And his back all humped up to me like that. And I thought, what's he doing? Well, and she looked over at me and 
I look for a tree to see just how, <laughs> how close to us because they can scratch, you know, about them young ones and they, you can't talk them out of it. So um, I uh, watched the old mother a little while, you know, she kept cooing, making noise, something like a bird. You'd have to know what one sound like. So was, she kept cooing in that cub and that cub wouldn't come. Well, I thought about my rifle and I thought, no, if I run in there and grab that rifle, if I'd shoot the old mother and leave two orphans in the woods, I didn't want to be guilty of that. And besides her charge in that 22 would be kind of small, you know, and sometimes didn't it go off, I'd snap it three or four times to make it go off. So I thought, well, I'll just get in that tree there. If she starts over here, I'll get up there in a tree, get me a little switch and just flip them across the nose. Their nose is very tender and they just squeal and go down, you know, and they leave you alone. So I thought I'd get in that tree, but the curiosity of that little fellow all sitting up like this. And I thought, what's he doing? So I kept slipping around watching her, you know, get a little farther away and get close to the tree. Because she kept cooing to that cub. So I got over a little further, and you know what that little fella had done? Now, I like flapjacks, or pancakes, I believe you call them out here. Down south, we call them flapjacks. And I'm not very good at making them, but I'm sure good at eating them. And, uh, you know, I was a Baptist. Now, I don't like to sprinkle, I really like to baptize them, really put the lasses to them. So I had me a can of molasses about this high sitting there, a little half-gallon bucket for my flapjacks. And that little fellow, you know, a bear likes sweet anyhow, he'd got that bucket of molasses open. And he was sitting there with a little paw about that wide and head up in his arms. He's just socking his little foot down and licking like that. Just right. And he, he'd lick that little tongue. And I started, hey, if he just had a camera, I'd love to show that this morning just to look at it. And there he was putting his little foot down there and licking like that. And I hollered, get away from there. Like that. And he didn't pay any attention to me. He just kept licking like that. He stopped that bucket out, see. And I hollered at him like, hey, turn around and look at me like that. He couldn't get his eyes open. He's just so full of molasses. You know, all over his eyes, his little belly. Just as full of molasses as he could be. And then after a while, he staggered off sideways and over to his mother. They got him up there in the bushes and started licking him. <laughs> they were afraid to set the bucket, but they could lick him. And I said, if that isn't a type of a good old Pentecostal meeting, just gets so full of good sweet stuff he got somebody lick off of it. That, that's a real fellowship meeting. Now we just come like this to get our hands in the bucket, each one of us, plumb up to the elbow of God's blessings. Feeling in it. Reminds me of Paul Rader. How many ever heard of Paul Rader? Well, I guess you all have. He's probably preached here years ago. He said one day he, him and his wife he was sitting at the table and, oh, you know how families are. Something came up, she wanted to go somewhere and he wouldn't let her go. So he said, no, I just can't do it. I got something else to do. And so he heard her feelings. He looked over and she was crying. So he just thought, well, cry. And he said, he got his hat and started out and she'd always meet him at the door and kiss him goodbye when he left. Said, Brother Bram, let's come to the door. Said, she was standing there with her head down. Said, she kissed me goodbye, all right. Said, I went out the gate and pulled the gate together and looked back. She'd always stand at the gate and wave. And said, she was standing, or stand at the door and waved as he went out the gate. Said, she was at the door, she waved. Said, I went on down the street and said, I begin to think about it. Said, my, my heart began to get bigger and bigger. <laughs> think about what had happened. What if something happened to me today? She's my wife. I love her. I remember the vows. Said, after a while, he got a hard guy, so big he couldn't stand it. And he turned around and back up that way, he went up the street, opened the gate, ran in the door real quick, shut the door open, looked around for her. Said, she's standing behind the door crying. Said, he just grabbed her, never said a word, turned around, kissed her. Turned around, walked out the door. Said he walked on down the gate and started out the gate. Said he turned around, she stands at the gate and said he waved goodbye. Said she waved goodbye again. I said, well, what was the matter? What was up? He said the last time it had a feeling in it. <laughs> so that's the way about religion. I like a religion that's got a feeling in it, you see. So. I'm not but much of a speaker, friend. I thought we'd come down tonight and kind of talk about the Lord for a little bit together. But I'm not much of a speaker, but I pray that God will take the words that we will use and have a feeling in it, you see. Mother Possum. Here not long ago, you might have heard it in the magazines. I love wild animals. And um, I was sitting on my porch with my student ministers down here, Mr. Mercer and Mr. Gold. I, they're tape boys, and they come up there, and we talk. We're sitting on the porch, speaking about last July, early one morning. Coming down the road, come an old possum. 
and she was crawling along and come all past four houses that didn't have any fences or gates and come to mine that had a fence and a gate and turned in. And I said, I know anyone knows animal life has studied it. A possum's blind in the daytime. They prowl at night. And I said, look at her. She's probably got rabies. And uh, Mr. Wood here, the book salesman, he had been out in the yard raking there, so he, there's a yard rake laying there, and I took the yard rake and went out and threw it over the old possum. And I said, well, I suppose, I said, oh, look, her left shoulder was all broke, mashed up, been chewed by the dogs or by a car, and I hope this doesn't make you sick, but maggots is all over it and green blow flies. I said, poor old things are dying. And I happened to notice, and I started to raise that up, and she was, usually they play possum. But when I raised it up, she took out for the house. And I threw it, the rake over again, a yard rake. And I found out that she, there's only two animals in the world that has pockets. That's kangaroo and possum. They pack their little ones in it. So when her pocket let down, she had nine little naked baby possums about that long. Well, the day before that, Leo and Jean and I were talking, a piece in the paper where a young, lovely looking colored girl had given birth to a baby, a illegitimate child. She wrapped it in a blanket and put water around it and smothered the child to death, tuck it out on the bridge in a taxi cab and dropped it off in the river. And the authorities had caught it. We were talking about how cruel that was. And I said, this mother possum is a better mother being a dumb brute than that woman was. That's right, got better morals than that woman. And so we were talking and Mr. Woods come up and Mrs. Woods and Mr. Gilmore, he come in, we was talking about him. As soon as I let that possum up, she tuck off towards the house as hard as she could go. And I said, look, she's only got about maybe 30 minutes more to live, but she'll spend that 30 minutes fighting for those little babies to live. And that woman won't have drowned hers. I said, that's real motherly love. So the poor old thing got right up to my steps and toppled over, exhausted. So I went there and I punched her. I said, she's dead. Uh, I seen her after her punch a little bit. I said, no, she's got life in her. Well, Mrs. Woods, Mr. Woods' wife, sort of a veterinary. She was standing there. She said, well, Brother Branham, the only thing to do with her now is, is go kill her and kill them little possums. She said, they're too little in the round mouth. Anyhow, you couldn't put them on a bottle. Said, you just don't let them suffer. And those little possums are trying to nurse that dead mother. And I said, oh my, that's too bad. I said, kill her? I said, yes. Oh, I said, I can't kill her. And he said, uh, I said, well, why? I said, I don't know. She said, well, you're a hunter. I said, yes, but I'm not a killer. I said, I, I, I can't kill her somehow. She said, well, let my husband Banks go kill her. I said, go get one of your guns and kill her. I said, I just can't do it. I don't know why. I said, you go let that poor thing lay there in that hot sun all day long like that, and that poor little baby is uh, nursing that old milk from her like that and die a death like that. I said, Sister Woods, I, I know you're right, but I, I just can't do it. So all day it was pretty heavy and around the house, the people coming and that night Mr. Woods come up and said, now look, Billy, you got to go out and take a little rest. So he and his wife, me and my wife, we talked a little ride. And, uh, we come from there running over a little old dog and I had him to stop and I went back and picked it up, mangy and fleas and lice all over him. And my wife said, I guess you're going to keep it. I said, yes, ma'am. Oh, she said, kill that dog. Honey said, the thing is dying anyhow. I said, I'm going to pray for him. I said, he's little and he ought to live. Ain't nothing wrong with him. So he's a great big fine collie now. So, you know, God does that. Sure does. So then we find out when we went in that night about 11 o'clock, I told the lights, there lay the old mother possum stretched out. Brother Wood said, well, now, Brother Brandon, you've hunted enough to know and hunted possums enough to know when the sun went down, if there's any, that possum has ever going to raise, it would have raised then. And you know that too, you people who know possums. Said she'd have raised right then, but said she'll never raise them more. She's done. I said, I believe do kind of all over and have a little possum still nursing. Miss Woods said, Brother Brandon, are you going to let that suffer like that? And I said, I don't know, Sister Woods. I just can't kill it. Billy come in, been fishing somewhere and come in about one o'clock. Throw the light on the old possum. There she laid. All night I thought about that old possum. Next morning I went out. I've got a little girl. She's 10 years old and she's just saw her first vision recently, a very spiritual child. And 
I found her going out on the porch with her little pajamas on about 6.30 in the morning. I went out there and looked over the side, leaned there by the door. There laid the old possum stretched out, and them little ones still trying to nurse. Becky said, Daddy, is she dead? And I said, I don't know, honey. She said, Daddy, why you go do with that poor old mother possum? And I said, honey, I don't know. You go on back to bed, sweetheart. I said, it's too early for you to be out. She said, Daddy, I've been thinking about that possum all night. I said, so have I. And she said, well, what are you going to do with it? You go let Brother Woods kill it? I said, no, honey, I just can't do that. I said, you run on back to bed now. And I went out and punched her and looked like she didn't move. And I tried a little bit and I seen she was still alive. Oh, but oh my, that big old leg is all swollen up and maggots and flies all over. And I said, poor old thing. I went back into the side room, to my den room. I just sat down there where the sick comes to be prayed for. And I was just rubbing my head like this. And I thought, well, what am I going to do with that possum? I got to do something. That's a shame. And something, I don't know how you go to believe this. That's up to you and God. I heard something say, well, she's waited at your door for 24 hours like a lady. You preached about her yesterday and took a text and said she's a real mother. She wanted to raise her babies. And I've had her laying at your door for 24 hours. You've never said a thing about it. Well, I said, I didn't know. What do you mean? I said, she come to be prayed for. She's waiting for her turn. I said, well, I didn't know she come. Oh, what's the matter with me? Am I talking to myself? Well, I thought, what is that? Now, I recognize the presence of the Holy Spirit. I opened the door and went out there and I stood by her. I said, Heavenly Father, Becky was looking down at her. I said, Heavenly Father, have I been so stupid to know that you with your divine grace? I said, now wait a minute. Yes, you know the birds of the air. You know all things. You know all. And why well, I said, then this old possum knows more about divine healing than a lot of preachers does. And I said, here she is. And now she ain't got no soul. So it encouraged me. You told me go pray for sick, and I've seen many times sick people be led. But if you thought enough of the respects of that old possum for her to raise her babies, and you had to pull, have the Holy Spirit to bring her, because she didn't have any soul, she's a dumb brute. And she come and laid there as a mother dying, waiting for her turn to be prayed for. I said, God, forgive me for being so stupid. I said, now, Heavenly Father, I pray if that be the case that you heal the old possum. I asked it in Jesus' name if you sent the old thing from the roller where she's chewed up and her laying there and she wants to raise her babies and you sent her here to be prayed for and let her in here. Well, I said, I'm sorry, I didn't understand it. So I pray that she'll be healed in Jesus' name. And no more than I said that, the old possum turned over and looked at me, got up. Picked up her nine little babies and put them right back in her bosom like this. They looked up to me as if to say, thank you, kind sir. Stuck that tail up in the air and right down the road and over to the woods as much as hard as she could. That's right. The devil stirrups. Down there one time in Miami, there was some kind of a duchess or something like that. Brother Bosworth said, Brother Branham, the Duchess of something, some island, something wants to meet you. I said, well, who is she any more than anybody else? See? He said, well, she wants to meet you. Will you wait just behind the tent? And I said, well, he's the manager, so there wasn't nothing I could do. And I said, all right. When he stepped outside the tent, there's a little place there, a little head roped off. And here come a woman through there with just about enough clothes on to water musket shotgun. She had earrings hanging plumb down like this. Looked like the devil had been using her neck for a saddle and using them for stirrups. He'd rolled her all over hell anyhow. That's right. Here she come down through there and packing a pair of glasses held out on a stick about... You know people ain't gonna look through glasses out that far. Holding it out like that. Holding it out on a stick like that. And she walked down through there, you know, with her stick out like that, looking like that, looking down, watching where she didn't run over something. She looked like that, and she walked up to me. She said, are you Dr. Branham? I said, no, ma'am. <laughs> no, ma'am. I said, I'm Brother Branham. She raised up her hand. She said, I am charmed to meet you. I said, get it down here so I'll know you when I see you again. <laughs> That's right. Brother, where are we anyhow? Six foot of dirt. Hallelujah. It's the grace of God that saves our heart from sin. 
not we in ourselves, but it's by His grace are we saved. Bubbling Springs. I said I used to pass by a little spring when I was a game warden in Indiana. And there was, it was always the happiest spring I ever seen in my life. Great springs in Indiana, they bubbled up with that fine cold water of limestone water. And one day I sat down by the spring to talk to it, just like I guess that Moses would have sat to the burning bush to speak with it. And I said, little spring, what makes you so happy that you're bubbling all the time? If I come here in the wintertime, you're bubbling. If I come spring, autumn, summer, whenever it is, you're bubbling. Is it because that maybe perhaps you're so happy that the rabbits come and drink out of you? Well, now, if he could talk, he'd say, no, that's, that's not it. I'd say, well, maybe because deers come by and drink out of you. He'd say, no, that's not it. I'd say, no, well, maybe it's because I come by once in a while and drink from you. No, that's not it. I'm glad that they all come and drink, but that's not the reason that I'm bubbling all the time. Well, what makes you bubble like that? What makes you so happy, always gushing up? If he could talk, he'd say, it's not me, it's something behind me pushing me. That's the way it is with a Christian experience. It isn't something that you're trying to work up. It's something behind working in you. It's eternal life that's moving up, gushing up. Like a, as he told the woman at the well, it'll be wells of water springing up into eternal life. It's something within the worshiper when he's been identified with Christ because he knows that he is alive. Fritz. Years ago, I used to have an old hunting dog. His name is Fritz. And he was half Airedale and half Newfoundland. He was a great big dog. And he used to go with me everywhere when I go hunting. The best old thing I ever had, he'd lay with me. And he put me in school clothes and hunting, tree and possums and skunks and what more I trapped. And so he just kept me in school clothes and I'd leave him anywhere. He'd find his way home. And one day we moved into the city, a policeman come by and throw the dog butt in the yard and killed him. When I come home and buried, I was just about 16, 17 years old, and I patted the last bit of dirt on there. I said, Fritz, I'll, I'll kill that man for that. Went in the house and got my rifle and started down to the police station to get him. And when I got on the road, a little old Ford run up behind me is my father. He grabbed that rifle out of my hands. A little bitty man slapped me upside the head and said, get in that car. And I went back and I said, Fritz, went to his grave. I said, Fritz, here's what I will. If Pop won't let me do it that way, I'll find him on the street walking someday and I'll lose control of my car. I promise you I'll get even with him, see, for killing you. And I meant it. And about a year after that, I was saved and I led this man to God and buried him after he was saved. Mr. Sharp, the police. Old dog was gone. I always thought after you're saved, I thought, wonder when I get over there if I see old Fritz. And while I was sitting there, I looked coming down across the hill and here come old Fritz coming up to me. And he was just licking his tongue, you know, and panting like that, looking at me. And I looked coming behind him, and here come old Prince, my horse, my saddle horse. And he run up to me, and he put his neck around me. And I said, oh, God, what is this? Just then a voice spoke and said, all that you ever loved and all that ever loved you, God has given to you. We were all here together. Oh, my. My heart just melted within me. All that you ever loved and all that ever loved you is gathered here with you to meet God. I said, oh, praise be to God. And about that time I felt myself moving. I said, I don't have to go back, do I? And I kept, in just a minute, I was back there at the bed again. Friend, death does not change a man. Amen. It just changes your dwelling place. My wife's a Christian. One time, this little woman had received the Holy Ghost. She was a very sweet little person. They, she said, well, she had a hard life, and her husband was an alcoholic. And so um, she just kept on. She bore with him. He said, you want to go to church, honey? Take off. But I went out to saloon down at the old Brown Derby down here. Going on. So they hung out down there all the time. It used to be Bonifers. Many of you old timers here remember Bonifer had that on the corner. It's called the Brown Derby now, I believe it is. So... Hanging around down there, and the first thing you know, one night come up a question about church, about Christians. One of the old drunks sitting there said, There ain't no such a thing as Christians anymore. There is no such a thing. All oh, this bunch of hypocrites, 
Said, see my ear smoking, drinking, doing the same thing that we do? <laughs> and um, said, call themselves Christians. There is no such. This one drunk raised up and said, just a minute. There's one <laughs> that I know about. Said, who is it? Said, it's my wife. <laughs> see, she becomes salty. He's catching it all the time. He said, I bet she's put to the squeeze. He said, no, she's still a Christian. I'll prove it to you. He said, I'll tell you what, let's do. Let's go up home. I'm not sure whether she's a Christian or not. He said, let's go up home. Now let's really be drunk. We're going to act like we're really drunk. Knocked at the door, come in, staggering over everything. And, and why did the chair sit around this way? And everything. And she set him all a chair. And his guest, you know, and tried to make him just as welcome as could be. He said, I want you to fix us some supper. And so they, she went out and fixed it and said, we want ham and eggs. He knew they had it, so they fixed the ham and eggs. When he got to that table, he looked at them like that, picked up his plate and slammed the stuff on the floor and said, you know, I don't like my eggs like that. Come on, boys, let's get out of here. Anyhow, like that, like that. They went out and sat down like that. And when she came out, she said, dear, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't get them fixed. I'll fix them over for you. Oh, nonsense. You know, they didn't want them that way in the first place. Just carrying on like that. They went out there, sat down, act like he was drunk. They heard her in there, kind of snubbing to herself, singing real low voice, Must Jesus bear the cross alone? All the world will free. There's a cross for everyone, and there's a cross for me. This consecrated cross I'll bear till death shall set me free. One drunk looked at her and said, She's a Christian. She's got it. And that little woman led her husband plus these others to Christ that night. Think, why? Think, just be real sweet. Just remember, he knows all about it. The Hornet's Nest. One day I was mowing my yard with a lawnmower. And I would try to lawnmower the front. And I would make a few rounds and somebody come in to be prayed for. I'd have to run change clothes and pray for him. While the front was growing up before I could get to the back. And it was on a hot summer afternoon. Gene, Leo, and them, the boys here, been to the place. I took off my shirt. No one could see me back there in the back. And I was running this power mower, and I forgot that right down at the end of the fence was a big nest of these hornets hanging there. And I was running this mower real fast to get it cut real quick, and I never noticed them, and I not home too much, and I slammed right into those hornets. Was aiming to burn them, get them out of there. And I hit that hornet's nest, and I with no shirt on, and just in a moment, the hole around me was covered with hornets. Anyone knows that one sting can kill you. Last summer, a man was stung on the lip by a honeybee that broke up some kind of a blood affair, died before the doctor could get there. A hornet will knock you flat on the ground when he stings you. And you're a whole hive of them over me. But now instead of being afraid, I don't know what you're going to think of me after this. It doesn't matter, because I'm telling the truth. You'll have to answer with God about what you think about it. I hit them hornets all around me, and instead of wanting to fight at them, something happened. I was afraid of them. I loved them. I thought little creatures of God, staying is the only way you got to protect yourself. That's your God-given weapon. And I disturbed you out of your house. I said, now, I've got to pray for God's sick children. I'm the servant of the Lord. Now, in the name of our Creator, Jesus Christ, go back into your nest. I'll not bother you no more. And when I meet you at the judgment bar, them hornets whirled around me and tucked circle and made a beeline, and every one of them went right back into their nest. Wow. The atmosphere had been changed. You say, Brother Brandon, that sounds silly. That's the reason you don't know the Bible. Did not the vines come after Daniel and could not touch him? The atmosphere was changed. Could the fire burn Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? The atmosphere was changed. And the God of Daniel still lives tonight. He's the same God. Calming the storm. Was up on the mountain 
Were that storm raging? How many heard it? Yeah. Oh, all of it. All right. Were the storm raging? And God being my judge, standing here, going down the mountain, when David Wood, he's here somewhere, I guess, that made me a sandwich, and it was quite a one. I think he's trying to get even with me for the one I made for his daddy a few years ago. He had bologna and, and meat and everything mixed together. And I put it in my shirt, and it rained, and just got just a big wad of dough. And I was coming down the mountain, it's so stormy, I couldn't even see my hand before me hardly. And I know just one thing, you're turned around because that wind's just whirling. Now there's witnesses here to that. One of them is one of our faithful deacons, which is Brother Wheeler. Are you here, Brother Wheeler? Where is he at? Uh, you're right here, Brother Wheeler. Brother Mann, a Methodist preacher from New Albany, is he Brother Mann in tonight? Uh, don't know whether he is or not. Brother Banks Woods, are you here, Brother Banks? He's in the recording room. All right. And, um, and David Woods. And uh, Brother Evans was there, I believe. Is that right, Brother Evans? Brother Evans, standing against the wall, was there. And how they broadcast for days, two days before that a mighty blizzard was sweeping the land. Brother Tom Simpson is here tonight. When coming down out of Canada, they asked him to bypass there because he couldn't get through. A blizzard was coming. Brother Tom, are you here? Or are you here? He's sitting right here. And there are the clouds come up and I said, brethren, everybody rushed out. There was nobody back there out of a hundred and something man back there. There was nobody back there but our little group and the cowboy, the rider. And we was going to stay. I called Sister Evans and had her to call the wife and tell her to tell Tony if I didn't get out, get somebody else to hold the breakfast for the businessman. And up on the mountain that, that day, I said, now when it... First little rain starts or anything, take for the camp, I said, within 10 or 15 minutes, you can't see your hands before you Well, that blizzards. And it'll dump 20 foot of snow just in a little bit uh, over the mountain. And that's how people, you read it in the paper, how they're back there and perish and everything. But we knew how to get out and they knowed where we was at. And so we felt led to stay. And um, so up on the mountain when that blizzard started, I started going down, and I was just about a half a mile from where I started, and the voice of God said, turn and go back. And I went back, as he told me. After waiting for a while and eating that sandwich that David gave me, and went back up there and sat down. And while I was sitting there in that wind twisting and blowing, the treetops leaning way over to sleet and snow, a flying like that, a voice said, I am the God of creation. I looked up, and I thought, where was that? That was a wind, maybe. He said, I created the heavens and earth. I still the mighty winds upon the seas and went on talking. I jumped up and took off my hat. And he said, just speak to the stormer and it'll cease. Whatever you say, that's what will happen. And I said, storm, you cease and sun, you shine normally for four days till we're out of here. And I no more and said it until the sleet, snow, and everything stopped in a moment or two. The hot sun is shining on my back. I seen the winds blowing like this, coming back from the north, coming down. I mean, from the east, coming from the east. It was coming from the west. The winds changed and come back this way, and the clouds like a mystic thing lifting up into the air, and the sun was shining in a few minutes. Funny-looking soldier. St. Martin was one. I was trying to think of him. See, he was a soldier. And in France, it was ordered that he, he should follow his father's work. But he always kind of believed. His mother was a believer. One cold day, he was a very humble man. They always furnished a man to polish his boots and keep him looking neat like a soldier should. He polished his servant's boots. He didn't go to their traditions and strains. He thought, man, we're made equal. So one cold day, he was standing by the gate of the city of Taurus when he was going in. And so there laid an old beggar in the street. You've read it, no doubt, many times. There laid a beggar in the street, freezing to death, a real cold winter. He's begging people, come over. Will somebody give me a cloak? I'll freeze tonight. I can't lay out on this ground like this. Will somebody give me a coat? Nobody. He said, please, somebody have mercy. An old man, I'm dying. I've served my time. I've done my best. Don't let me die. I'm freezing to death. Somebody wrap me up, will you? So he just stood back. St. Martin looking. He wasn't there. Believer, he wasn't a Christian then. He hadn't accepted it. He just stood and watched. Nobody did it. When the crowds went on by, some of them plenty well to do it. He only had one coat, and that was his military coat. He pulled out his sword and cut it half in two. Wrapped the old beggar up in it and went on. 
People laughed at him going down the street, one piece of coat hanging on him. What a funny looking soldier they said it was. Made fun of him. That night he was woke up in his sleep. He looked standing by the side of his bed and there stood Jesus wrapped in that old piece of coat that he had wrapped the beggar in. Then he knowed, in so much as you've done unto the least of these, my little one, it was a paradox, his call. He was a, he was a messenger of that age who stood for the scripture against all the wickedness of Catholicism in that day God chose him and he let him see Christ by a paradox. Nothing but the truth. There's a family named Wright. Brother Woods and I went out to see them. They make the communion wine for the church. Little Edith was sitting there in the room, a little crippled girl. And she'd been sick all of her life. And so we'd always look to God to heal her. Her sister, a widow, her husband had been killed. Her name was Hattie, very humble little woman. And while Brother Banks and I went out to get her a rabbit, they'd cooked a big cherry cobbler and made me sit down and eat. We was all sitting around the table. We were talking about this. It just happened a few days before. And while I was sitting around the table talking about this, all at once I said, what could have happened? I said, Brother Wright, you're an old man. Honey squirrels all your life. Brother Shelby, you're an expert squirrel hunter. Brother Wood, so are you. I've hunted them since a kid. Did you ever see a squirrel in a sycamore and locust thicket? No, sir. I said, it just wasn't there. I said, the only thing I know is just the same God. When Abraham needed a ram, he was Jehovah Jireh. He could provide for himself. And I said, I believe it's the same thing. And little old Hattie sitting back there said, Brother Renham, that's nothing but the truth. She said the right thing. When she said that, the Holy Spirit dropped over into that channel again. Every one of them felt it. I raised up. I said, Sister Hattie, thus saith the Lord. You said the right word like the Syrophiopian woman said. The Holy Spirit speaking to me now and said for me to give you the desire of your heart. I said, now, if I be God's servant, if it is, it'll happen. If I am God's servant, then I'm a liar and it won't happen. I'm a deceiver. I said, now try and sense the Spirit of God. She said, Brother Random, everybody was crying. said, what shall I ask? I said, you got a crippled sister sitting there. I had $20 in my pocket to give to her that she had put in a donation. A woman don't make a capital of $200 a year on that little old poor farm. Her and two boys. Her boys had got to be regular rickies. A school days, you know, and just sassing their mother, 15, 16 years old. And all they were standing over there laughing at what I was saying. And I said, you've got a father and mother sitting here so old. You haven't got any money. Ask for the money and see if it comes in your lap. Ask for your sister to see if she don't get up and walk. I knew then. Like Job. There's just something you know when you strike it. I said, I know. Here I stand before about ten people. I said, if this doesn't happen, then I'm a false prophet. I said, what shall I ask? I said, it's up to you to make your decision. I cannot make your decision. She looked around the little woman. And all at once, she said, Brother Branham, the greatest desire in my heart is the salvation of my two boys. I said, I give you your boys in the name of Jesus Christ. And them sniggered, laughing, fun-making boys fell across her mother's lap and surrendered their life to God and was filled with the Holy Ghost right there. The hound dog that ate the glass. Mr. Wood had painted my porch the other day, and he, I locked the door and come out the front door and pulled it together when I went out on a sick call. When I come back, my door was locked and I couldn't get in. I had my family in the car. Well, there wasn't but one thing to do is go out and get the hammer and break the window out and go in. So I went out and broke the window out. And and when I hit it with the hammer, it just splattered little glass everywhere. Well, my young daughter, Rebecca, they, she goes and sweeps it all up, little beat up glass, and she sat in the kitchen the next morning when she was washing the dishes, she was talking to her sister, Sarah, and she broke a glass and she dumped it in the box and some stuff on top of it. 
And the first thing you know, a little hound come by and got in the garbage can and eat that glass with that food. The poor little fellow was laying on the bank just having fits and rolling over and, oh, I never seen a dog suffer so and I couldn't find no one he belonged to. And Mr. May next door said, Billy, I believe the best thing for us to do is take him and shoot him. Well, I said, we wouldn't want to shoot somebody's dog. See, it looks like a nice hound. I said, I wouldn't do that. And he laid around there about four or five days bleeding and all oh, just in a terrible shape. Little fellow couldn't get up no more. He's just going, I never seen a dog so sick, just jump jerking like that. And, um, and I said, well, won't you take him out to the veterinary? I said, a veterinary will put him to sleep. So I said, well, there's no need to take him to a veterinary. And little Joseph and I walked out there in the yard and take him some beef broth and things. The little fellow couldn't eat it. He was too sick. Now, this is true, friends. I'm your brother. Joseph looked up to me as if to say, Daddy, can you help him? I said, Joseph, you hold Daddy's hand. I'm going to lay my hand on the little dog. God's my judge. Knelt down and had prayer for that little dog. He got up and eat his supper and went on down to the field, just as happy as he could be. Now, that is true. It wasn't but about 15 feet from where the old mother possum was healed at. That's right, you've heard that story. About 15 feet. If God will hear a prayer for a hound dog, how much more will he hear it for a human being, a child of his, that's washed in the blood of the Lamb? Caribou and Grizzly Bear. Brother Eddie was along when the Lord gave me the vision about the bear and the caribou. That, how many remembers that when I told you? All right. He was there. He was a young fellow had on the checkered shirt. <laughs> Brother Eddie Biscoe. And he stood there where, and I, I asked him if they had a checkered shirt. Any of them? Nope. No one had. I said, well, my, it's got to be a checkered shirt. It's going to be a, a big silver tip grizzly and a and some kind of an animal's got 42 inches over its horns, like this. Looked like a deer. And uh, that was about six months, I said, year, you know, before it happened. Long about this, all earlier in this the year. Then I was invited up there to this man to go hunting. I'd never been back in that country, back there where we went. And I said it at the little trailer, that's way up on the Alaskan Highway where there's nothing but woods and mountains and animals. And that night at the trailer, when I was telling Brother Bisco back there and, and Brother Southwick, he said, well, uh, uh, we're going up in sheep country. He said, it won't be up there. And I said, yes. And I said, it was uh, one of the little fellows was with me had a checkered shirt on. Nobody had a checkered shirt. Brother Bisco didn't have one. None of the rest of us had one. Second night up, we'd seen spotted ram way up above timberline. Now, that's way up where timber don't even grow, where there's nothing but caribou and sheep. And we'd spotted some way away, and on the road down that afternoon, Brother Biscoe had stumbled into some water and gotten wet. The next morning, we got up early and started after the rams that we thought we were going to get. And on his, we got up there, and we had eaten our dinner, and we couldn't find the rams, and Brother Biscoe had just shot a caribou. So then I was looking around and we went up, Brother Southwick said to me, he said, I believe we'll, if you want to walk right good, Brother Brandon, we'll go over this mountain down in that draw, them rams might have went over there, which is a long walk. But it don't get dark, maybe a real late, maybe 10 or 11 o'clock sometimes. It's a good long walk on them rocky mountains. So I like to walk. And so we uh, stand there with our arms around one another, both of our beards turning gray with our arms around each other crying and knowing. I said, Brother Bud, I hope someday in the millennium I can walk all the mountains there. He said, I hope I'm with you, Brother Brandon. Hallelujah. And we stand there just rejoicing in the Lord. And I love the mountains so well. And then we went down. That's when Brother Bisco there shot the, uh, the, the caribou that he's a missionary to the Indians. And he wanted to feed this to his Indians. So we went down, ate our dinner, dressed the caribou out, come back. Brother and I were going up across the mountain, and when we happened to look over, and in a distance with my glasses, I spotted this animal that I saw just in the panoramic, like I told you here. Brother Bisco there standing right by our side. And so I said, there is that animal. And he put the glass on and said, it's a great big old mammoth bull caribou. And I said, I've never seen it. I thought they had panel horns, but this one had spikes. He's an odd looking fella just like I saw in the vision. I never shot caribou before. So, well, he said, if the Lord's give him to you, he said that, just, I said, yes, that's bound to be it. The only thing I'm wondering about is that checkered shirt. 
And I looked around and Brother Eddie, his wife must have put it, she's there with him, must have put it in his duffel bag. When he got wet the day before, he changed shirts and there was a second shirt. I said, this is it. Amen. When I got over and got the caribou, he, Bud said to me, he said, now, Brother Branham, uh, you say these horns are 42 inches? I said, that's what they'll be. He said, looked to me like about 92. I said, no, they're 42 inches. He said, now, according to what you told me, before we get back to that boy down there with a checkered shirt on, Eddie, where they're going to meet us down below the mountain, a couple of miles, said, you're going to kill a grizzly bear. I said, that's thus saith the law. Amen. He said, Brother Bram, where is he coming from? I can see for 50 miles around. I said, he's still Jehovah Jireh. Amen. The Lord can Amen. provide for himself. If he can make squirrels come into existence, if he can make a ram come into existence, if he has spoken about a bear, a bear can come into existence. Amen. Us trying to pack this heavy caribou down the trophy down the mountain and I'd pack the rifle part of the time and then he'd pack the rifle and vice versa. And when we got almost to a big glacier, while we got under there, it's kind of hot. We get in the glacier of ice and sit down there a while to cool off. He said, you know, Brother Bram, we're not over about a mile from where Eddie and Blaine, them two boys, be standing. I said, old oh, bear bear be showing up. <laughs> I said, bud, I believe you're doubting it. He said, Brother Bram, my brother had epileptic fits for so many years. And you told me once, the first time up here when we went down to another place, told me what that boy looked like. And Eddie was riding right by my side there on a horse when the Lord gave the vision. I told him what to do with the boy. Fitz stopped. And I, he said, I can't doubt it. I said, Bud, I don't know where the bear is coming from. I was about 50. I'm 55 now, so that's been about three years ago. I was about 52 or 53. I said, I've never seen it fail. God will give me that grizzly bear before I get to them boys. Amen. It was almost down to where the small spruce and timber started in. Little lower down the hill was almost into the timber. He sat down, he was once packing the trophy, then I had the rifle. And he said, that old bear better be showing up, hadn't he? I said, he'll be there, don't you worry. He said, I can see every hill. I said, I, but I see the promise. See, see? He promised. I said, over what he? I said, bud, what is that sitting right there? He thought, that's a big silver chip grizzly. <laughs> so that's him. When we got the grizzly and come back, I remember in the vision I told you I was scared about the rifle. There's a little bitty 270 small bullets. You see, it's on tape. I got the right, uh, bear just about 500 yards, like it said. Bud said, you better shoot that bear in the back. He said, you ever shoot a grizzly before? I said, nope. He said, oh, they don't know what death is. I learned that a little later. <laughs> so he said, they don't break up from shock. He said, you better sh shoot him. I said, according to the vision, I shot it in the heart. He said, well, that vision said so. I'm going to stand by. And I said, here we go. <laughs> and we got a little closer. When I raised up, the bear saw me. That was what he wanted to make a charge. And I, I shot the bear. It didn't seem like it even hurt him. Here he come. And before I get another bullet in the gun, a bear died about 50 yards from him. Bud is white around the mouth. He said, Brother Bram, I didn't want him on my lap. I said, <laughs> I didn't either. He said, I'm glad that vision said you got him. <laughs> he said, now if that, if them horns are 42 inches, I'm going to have a, I'll say it the way he did, I'm going to have a screaming fit. I said, well, you just have it right now because that's what it's going to be. When we got out of Brother Eddie, I said to Brother Eddie, we tied the horses off. They're scared of a bear. Oh, my. They had to smell it. We couldn't skin him out. too late. Had to come back the next day. And then we broke up the string about <laughs> ten times and horses running everywhere. So then um, when we got out there, he said, went and got the um, tape measure out of his saddlebag. said, Blaine, I said to Brother Eddie, I said, watch that little hand now, according, I thought it might have been Billy Paul, little bitty hand, hold the tape measure around the horn. I said, watch that little hand, punched Brother Eddie, we stepped back, we put it right up like that, exactly on the nose, 42 inches, see, just exactly. Jesus never failed. Amen. That word will never fail as long as it comes from God. Green eyes. So I went upstairs 
and I sat down. And when I did this, an escalator, it was in J.C. Penney's store, and the escalator bringing the people up. Well, I really turned sick at my stomach of uh, seeing those women come up there, young, old, and indifferent, wrinkled, young, in every way, with little bitty shorts on, their filthy body, and those sexy dressed women with those great big heads uh, like that and here they come and one coming around that escalator is coming right up like that where I was sitting back in a chair sitting there with my head down and I turned and looked and one of them coming up the steps was saying Spanish speaking to another woman she was a white woman speaking to the Spanish woman and when I looked all of the ones I was changed there I'd seen that before. Her eyes, you know how the women are doing now, painting their eyes just recently like cat, you know, put it up like this, and wearing cat glasses and everything, you know, with eyes up like this, and that green stuff there, their eyes, there was that thing that I seen when I was a child. There was the woman, just exactly. And I just got numb all over and began to look around. And there was those people mumbling, you know, going on about the prices and things in the building. And I just looked like it. I just changed for a moment. And I looked and I thought, that's what I saw in hell. There they was, that canker. I thought because they were in hell, what made them that way, that greenish blue uh, under their eyes. And here was these women painted with greenish blue. Just the way that vision said about 40 years ago. Okay? Uh, about 40 years ago is what it's been. I'm 54. I was 14. So about 40 years ago, I, and that's the, the, that's the number anyhow of the judgment, you see. Now, there was, I'd seen that, and I couldn't even speak to my wife when she come. She's over there trying to get a Sarah and the kids some kind of a, a dress or something for school. And I, I couldn't even I couldn't even speak to her. She said, Bill, what's the matter with you? I said, Honey, I'm as, I'm almost a dead man. And she said, What's the matter? Are you sick? I said, No. Something's just happened. Now she don't know. She's waiting for this tape to return. I've never said it to nobody. And I thought I'd wait, as I promised, bring it to the church first. Okay? Bring it to the church. And that's my promise. And you'll realize after tonight, reason I try to keep my promise. And I thought then, as I noticed them cankered looking eyes on them women. There were the Spanish, the French, and Indian, and white, and all together. But that great big heads, you know, bushed up with that combs where they comb it back, way big, and. Then comes out, you know, you know how they do it, fix it in the, uh, like they do it. And then them cankered looking eyes and the eyes with a paint that run back like a cat's eye. And them talking and there I was again, standing there in J.C. Penney's store, back in hell again. I, I, I got so scared, I thought, Lord, surely I haven't died and you've let me come to this place after all. And there they were making just around like that, uh, in that vision, like you could just barely hear it with your ears, you know, just the mumbling going on people. And them women coming up that escalator and walking around there, and ooh, ooh. there's them green, funny looking eyes, mournful. My wife come up and I said, just let me alone a minute, honey. I said, if you don't mind, I, I want to go home. And she said, are you sick? I said, no, just go ahead, honey, if you got any shopping to do. She said, no, I'm finished. And I said, let me take you about an arm. See? I walked, I said, what's the matter? I said, meaty, I, 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 something happened up there. Peppermint candy. We used to go to town on Saturday night. Remember when we used to go get our groceries on Saturday night, everybody? And we had an old Jersey wagon, and Pop would put some straw back in there, and all of us kiddies would get back there, and me and Mother would sit up front. They drove a little old mule. We'd go about seven miles down to the city, and Pop made, I believe, it was 75 cents a day, and he would buy all the groceries and things that last us through the week. And when he paid the grocery bill, Mr. Grower, the grocerman, why, well, he'd 
get us a little sack of candy and stick candy, old peppermint, and all oh, it was good. And so the thing that was is about eight of them little brandoms, and maybe give about six sticks of it to home. So there's just about eight there little Irish eyes watching that candy to be broke just equally among each one. We'd sit out there, you know, it'd be cold weather, we'd cover up in quilts, we'd get the, that candy, and all the boys would go to eat their candy. Now, I kind of played a little trick on them. Now, don't you boys try this, because it might not work. So i take my candy and act like I was eating it, and then get a piece of the paper sack off of the something, you know, and wrap it up and put it in my pocket. i wait till, until Monday. My mother would say, William? I'd say, yes, ma'am. Say, go to the spring, get a bucket of water, a big old cedar bucket and a gourd dipper, you know, and I'd have to go down to the spring. That thing was heavy. I'd say, Edward, I called him Humpy was his nickname, brother next to me. I said, tell you what I do, I'll let you lick on this stick of candy till I count ten if you go get that bucket of water for me. <laughs> Very few shores I had to do on Monday, so as long as that candy lasted, I was a businessman. <laughs> Lick on that candy, and I, I count, and I say, one, two, you say, not so fast. I'd say, two, three, now you're counting too fast. I'd start over again, he'd get a couple extra licks, you know, and some, and he'd keep that candy there, wrap it back up, so I had something else to do, you know. <laughs> Cut it easy, that old money, I was a man of wager. <laughs> now, to go back those days again, that was good candy. You know, maybe tomorrow I could go out and get a box of Hershey's, but it wouldn't taste just like that did, you know. That was really good. A magic flower. Kids, you each one seem like mine. You each one seem like it's my sons and daughters in one way you are. See? Spiritually speaking. That's right. The Lord God has, has put your souls into my care. Because you come listen to me, you believe me. See? And in one sense, the words, you are my sons and daughters. That's right. Always remember, keeping the commandments of God is a great thing. Being raised in a good home is a heritage from God. And to be fine kids with personalities as you have, good. Wonderful to have an education. It's wonderful to even live in this free land. We've got many things to be thankful for, but there's one thing that you just don't inherit. You've got to accept it. That's eternal life. And you only do that by following Jesus by a born-again experience. Don't neglect that. A little story one time I heard of a man who was all, he was poor and he, he always wanted to, it's a little fairy story like, it always stuck with me though. And one day he picked a flower and the flower was magic. And the flower answered to him and said, You've been poor all your life. He said, Now, um, uh, ask what you will, and it'll be given to you. He said that yonder's mountain would open up, and I could go therein and find the gold in the mountain. Well, the, he said, You will have to take me with you wherever you go. See? You'll have to take me with you. So, Wherever I am, then you can ask what you will. He walked to the mountain, and the mountain opened up, and he went in the shells was full of gold and diamonds, as the little fairy story goes. He laid the flower down on a, on a table or a rock, and he run and grabbed a great big gem. And he uh, said, I must go show this to my friends, and now I'm a rich man. I have everything now. I must show this. And so the flower spoke but said, you have forgot the main thing. So he runs back and picks up said, well, uh, maybe I'll, I'll get a piece of gold, I'll get a piece of silver. And so he said, uh, I'll, uh, I'll hurry out to tell the people how rich I am, what all I've got. And he got to the door and the flower said, but you forgot the main thing. So he runs back again. He said, in here we find all kinds of materials. So he picked up a, a stone. He said, I'll go take this stone and show the people what kind of a stone this mountain's made out of so I can find my way back to it. See? 
And he started out the door, and the flower said for the, its final time, you have forgot the main thing. Or he said, oh, shut up. See, he didn't want to hear it anymore. Forgot the main thing. And he ran out the door. And when he did, the door closed behind him with the flower on the inside. The main thing was the flower. See? The main thing was the flower. Chatter, chatter, chatter. Here a few years ago, I was up here in Colorado where I'm a guide on an outfit. Been taking people out for years. One day, the rancher and I went back late after many of the we just called the dudes that got in and got their deer and so forth and went out then we go back way high into the mountain there's where i have a little private conference every time i go up with the lord he always shows me something or draws me near him when i get away from everything and this year the snow had been a little late and the elk herd was high there's snow up on top so I had to go up high to find the elk. One afternoon up there, it was long and last of October, the, the Quakers down low was just like firecrackers, so brittle and dry. And I was up in the snow and the weather can change so quickly up there. It can be a, one moment of raining, then snowing, and then sun shining. And there come up a storm and I got behind a tree and set my rifle down and waited till the blow went over and I was right by an old blow down near the timber line. That's as high up as the timber grows till you get into pygmy spruce and so forth. Then when I was amazed as how I was sitting there behind the tree hearing the winds blow and thinking of the Lord behind a big pine tree and after a while the storm let up I raised up looked around and the great elk herd that I was trying to get into They'd been separated during the storm, and I could hear the big bulls a bugling. Oh, there's something about it that just puts something alive in you to hear them fellows bugle. Have a great respect for them. Then over on the mountain, I heard a wolf howling, its mate answering it down in the bottom. Looked over towards the west, and the sun was setting, and just as going through the crevices of the mountains, the great magic eye looked like of God looking across the mountaintops, blue horizon, and seeing then where the winds had blowed and the, the water had froze on the evergreens and it formed a rainbow that went all the way across the canyon. All that together, I just broke down like a baby and began weeping. There it was. God in the rainbow, the covenant. Yes. Look upon as Alpha and Omega, Jasper and Sardis, both Reuben and Benjamin, first and the last. There he was howling up there in the wolf. Here he was bugling in the, the elk. Everywhere you look up there seemed to be God. That's the way I like to get that inspiration. Get up in there alone with God. So high, miles and miles and miles. Couldn't get down for a couple of days to take me to get down from where I was to where the horses was hitched. But just up there alone with God, sleep out there that night in the mountain. And while I was up there, I just got one of them kind of a real rejoicing spirits on me. I guess it's not strange to you Pentecostal people. And I got so happy, I set the gun down against the tree and began to run around and around the tree, just jumping around as hard as I could, screaming to the top of my voice, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And I guess if somebody would have come in the woods, they'd thought there was someone out of the insane institution there. <laughs> round and around the tree, I went just as hard as I could go, screaming and kicking up the pine needles. I had to blow off the steam somewhere out of burst it. it was a, I was just having a wonderful time because I was right in the presence of God, having a conference with Him. Praise just God. speaking, how great thou art, how great thou art. There you are everywhere. You are there in the skies and the magic eye of the sun running to and fro through the earth. 
There you are in the rainbow. There you are in the wolf. There you are in the elk. There you are in the winds. Here I'm blowing through those pines as if to say, Adam, where art thou? See, moving around. Inspiration, a real genuine conference having with God. And all at once I was interrupted. And uh, I just don't like to be interrupted in them kinds of times. So I just like to scream it out till I get, get all satisfied. Then I looked and there was a little pine squirrel. Oh, he is a little rascal about that long. The blue coat policeman of the woods. And he's scared of everything in the country and they all listen for him because he's always ready to chatter, chatter at something. He jumped up on an old stump or log there, looked over at me and began just barking as hard as he could. Chatter, 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 chatter. And I thought, well, what's the matter with the little fellow? I said, don't you like that? I said, watch this then. And around and around and around and around the tree went again. And he just kept chattering the more. I said, I'm praising my creator, little fella. I said, I'm having a good time with him. We're holding a conference here. I told him I was empty and he's filling me. See, here's where it goes around and around and around the tree went again. And I happened to notice the little guy wasn't noticing me so much as he kept cocking his little head sideways and his little eye bugged out on the cheek almost looking down like this. Well, I stopped and I thought, now what's interrupting me? And I looked down in that blowdown. And during the time of the storm, it forced the big eagle down into the, the brush where the trees were lapped and years before it had a blowdown. And he was chirping or, or fussing at this eagle. And the big eagle was crawling out from under this brush and he uh, looked up at me and jumped up on the log and I thought, well, now what's so godly about you? And I Looked at him like that, and I thought, well, God, why did you let me stop worshiping you and shouting just to look at that old eagle? Well, an eagle, God likens himself to an eagle, and he calls his prophets eagle, because the eagle can fly higher than any other bird there is. There's nothing can follow him. If a hawk would try to follow him, it'd disintegrate in the air. And that's right. He's, well, he's got an eye that he can see after he gets up there. That's the reason I say anybody that's jumping, just jump as high as you can live, you know. That's all, because how good does he get up if you can't see something while you're up there? It doesn't do any good. So he, um, he gets up there and he's got an eye. He can see far off things before they get there. And that's the reason God likened the eagles uh, to his prophets, or his prophets to the eagles. And he calls himself Jehovah Eagle. So, and we're eaglets. There's a lot of difference between an eagle and a chicken. They're both birds, but one of them's earthbound and the other one's heavenbound. So that's just a lot different. Only they're about cousins or something. So if the chicken can't get his feet off the ground, don't worry. He's just a chicken to begin with, you know. He'll never get up there to know what an eagle knows. They can fly out there in the heavenlies. So I watched this fella as he was sitting there with his great big uh, gray-looking eyes watching me. And uh, I thought, well, there's one thing I admire about him. He's not afraid. And I, I hate a coward. So God does too. So a man that's afraid after he's been healed to testify about it. A man that God has saved and then he's ashamed to tell somebody that he's saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. I've got much confidence in his salvation. So when you really get it, you want to tell everybody you just can't Amen. keep still. What the church needs is some more Holy Spirit and fire in it that moves. That moves the church. It takes fire to move the church. So this old fellow, I watched him for a few moments, and after a while, after he seen that I was admiring him, I said to him, Hey, do you know I could shoot you before he got off that log? Just to see, just see if he's scared of me. He wasn't afraid. He just sitting there. And I noticed, what makes you so... Uh, Sure yourself. And I noticed he kept moving his wings, just feeling if all the feathers was in right condition. Because <laughs> he had a lot of confidence in them wings, and he noted he could be in that timber before I ever put my hand on that rifle. And there I got a lesson. I thought, you're in this conference, I'm learning something. See? 
Now, that eagle had two wings that God gave him, and he had confidence in those wings. He knew what he could do with them wings, and he wasn't afraid of me at all. So he knew he could be in that timber before I even got my hand on the rifle. And I thought, if that uh, eagle with, with two wings that God gave him know that he could escape there before I could do anything about it, what are a Christian that's received the Holy Ghost? As long as you can feel his presence around you and everything's in running order. No condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus that walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. When you feel that running condition, don't don't worry about what Satan's going to do. Just, you know, you're on good terms then. So I watched him that way and come to find out he wasn't afraid of me. But he just didn't like to hear that little old a uh, ground squirrel, a little old pine squirrel standing there going, chatter, 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 like he's going to tear him to pieces. Well, he wasn't going to do nothing. It's too little. The eagle could have picked him up and that would have been why well, his foot was bigger than the squirrel. So, but the little squirrel was jumping up and down like he's going to tear him to pieces, <laughs> just making a bluff out of it. You know. Finally, the old eagle got enough of it. So he just made one big jump and flopped his wings about twice, and then he set his wings. And I stood there and watched that eagle till I cried. He never flopped his wings, flop, flop, flop. He just made a couple of flops till he got his up above the timber line, and then he just knowed how to set his wings in them air waves coming up the mountain, and it just carried him on, 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 till it become just a little spot and never moved a feather. He just knew what to do. And I thought, isn't that it? It isn't join the Methodists and go join the Baptists and then join the Assemblies and then join the Church of God. It isn't flop, flop here and flop, flop there. It's just knowing how to set your wings of faith in the power of God. And when the glory rolls in, just ride up on it. Oh, oh. Get away from them little earthbound chipmunks and Chatter, chatter, days of miracles just passed, no such thing as divine healing, no Holy Ghost no more, it's the part of the apostles, long time ago, just set your wings and fly away, on, 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 until he can't hear it no more. That's the kind of conference we want with God. That'll lift us up above the shadows, get us away till all the criticism and anything, you can't hear it no more. Just be shut in with God. You don't have to join this one, join that one. Just know how to set your faith. That's right. Just set your faith in the Word of God. And when that Old and New Testament gets spread out there that He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and when the power of God rides in, ride with it. Just go right on up. Up, 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 up all the way. He is same yesterday, today, and forever. He cannot fail. Honoring the Resurrection. Now, you say, Brother Bram, you hunt. Did you ever hunt on Sunday? Let me tell you something. Now, I'm not patting myself to the back of this. But I'm, I'm not a Sabbatarian now. I believe the Holy Spirit is our Sabbath. I believe that. But I believe we should honor that resurrection as a memorial. That's a memorial. That I, if you honor any day, honor that resurrection. Now, there's no law on keeping any certain day because you enter into the Sabbath, the peace, when you enter into Him. Uh, I've got that question here to answer pretty soon, anyhow, if the Lord willing, about what is the Sabbath day. And I'll explain it, God willing. And now, notice, remember this. See, when I was a little boy, right up here where Ike lived on the road, I was about 14 years old. I was trapping for a living. The only thing I had to help get bread in our house was catching skunks muskrats, possums. I loved trapping. And I had to do it. I'd go to school smelling like a skunk. And I, I had only one pair of clothes, and that's all I could wear. That's all I had. Mom would take them off and wash them, put them back on, and that's how I went to school. Little boy. But I stand up there one night, I said, I got them traps set up there around Wathens up above that I leave every morning by 2 o'clock with a lantern to run these traps and I get back in time to go to school. I catch a rabbit, I got 15 cents out of it. I get a box of shells out of that, and maybe that kill three or four rabbits. What we didn't have to make some biscuits and rabbits while uh, gravy for supper, 
I'd sell the other, maybe get enough to get some bread or some meal or some flour to make gravy with. I don't know where you had to live like that or not. I'd set trout lines on the river, go down and get them fish and sell them for 10 cents a pound. Set my trout lines. I didn't have no boat. I'd swim out with a log, get in the river and it's still cold, put my bucket of bait out here on the log and to paddle and paddle out there. I got my naked body in the river and run this, have me a string on this side, tie my fish up. I'm old catfish fitting me in the lake going along like that and put my bait on. But look, a many a night have I went out in that river at 11 o'clock and shake every piece of bait off that line. If I couldn't catch enough in six days, I didn't want the one come on the seventh. I stood there in the rain one night. I could just see myself yet standing leaning against. I was a sinner. I stand leaning against the post like this, the door. Oh, it was pouring down rain. Pretty near 11 o'clock, I said, I'll be late tonight. But I'm going to spring every one of those traps. I won't catch him on the Sabbath. I said, I won't, I, I won't set them traps. God honored that. Prescription for Jesus. Here some time ago, a minister friend. I just heard this told. I believe it. One hot afternoon down in Georgia, he was visiting with this a druggist. The old druggist was a, a fine old Christian brother, full of the Spirit of God. And he said, come in and sit down and let's have a, a Coke. They were sitting there drinking a Coke. He said, I want to say something to you. And you perhaps will not believe this. Well, let's hear it first, said the minister. <clears throat> he said, I have always tried to do my best for God. He was a deacon in a church. He said, I've always tried to live to my calling and do that which was right. He said, I've never cheated anybody. I've always testified for my Lord everywhere I could. And said, I, to my drugs here said, I've tried to carry the very highest class that could be bought. I've never overcharged anybody. I've tried to do everything was right that I know how to do to serve the Lord. He said, I'm going to tell you what happened. He said, my son, who is studying to be a druggist too, to follow me, he was in the front of the building there one day. And said, he was doing a time of the depression. Said, a little lady walked into the, the door and said, uh, you could see what her trouble was. And uh, she used to be a mother. And her husband, both of them poorly dressed, said they give the prescription to, over to my uh, son. And said uh, to have it filled, for the woman was in need of this certain thing that the doctor had prescribed for her. And said, uh, uh, he said, this will be uh, so much, such and such. When the, the uh, to-be father asked, how much will it be, so and so. He said, sir, I will not be able to uh, get the prescription fulfilled. Or filled. He said, because that I haven't any money. Well, he said, my son said, go right down the street there, just a half a block, or block and turn left and you'll see where the the place is where they have charity and you go there to the county and they will perhaps uh, give you um, uh, 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 the money to have or, or an order that they'll pay for this prescription because uh, it's got the lady has to have the the, the medicine right away and said so he went out of the place started and said he listened to his son and something said, oh no, don't do that. Said that woman needs that. Said he had to think that long line of people down there, it's hard for a well man to stand in the line, let alone a mother in that condition. Said I said to my son, go call him, tell him to come back. He said, and I rushed to the door and said, come back, come back. And they come back and I said to my son, feel that, there's no charge. And said, my son, give me the prescription. And I went over and had it filled and filled it up the best that I could and brought it out to give to the lady and tell her that uh, there'd be no charges on this. That was all right because she was in need of it real bad and, and uh, I'd get by without it. So uh, the money for it. So said, I just started to lay the medicine in her hand. And when I did, I looked at the hand. The 
give her scarred. <laughs> then I looked up and I was putting it in Jesus' hand. <laughs> but I learned then with the scriptures what it meant in so much as you've done unto the least of these, my little ones. Yes. Said, you believe that? This fellow said to me, why, well, sure I believe that. It was a paradox. Incredible. But it's true. The Maniac in Portland. I was preaching, 6,000 people inside, and I don't know how many outside, the rain pouring. Old Roberts, you know, the rest of them would come on the scene in them days. And I was, the tinsel was on the meeting, certainly. And while I was speaking, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, there was about a couple of hundred preachers sitting behind me. And all of a sudden, down through that building come a great big man, thick, about six foot two, weighed about 240, 250, gray suit on, going like this, just real hard. I thought he must be bringing a message for someone. And when he got near the platform, all those preachers realized who he was, and they took a run as hard as they could go. He was a maniac out of an insane institution. And he ran to the platform and he started walking up towards me and he said, I weighed 128 pounds at the time. And he said, you snake in the grass, you hypocrite, you're imposing yourself as a servant of God. I'm going to break every bone in your body tonight. And I'll show this people that you're nothing but a big liar. I turned and looked at him. Ordinarily, I'd been scared to death. But instead of that, something happened. Oh, I wished it would always happen. Instead of despising that man, I love him. Something has to do it. I beg God, let me get in that state and stay there forever. But I love the man. I thought, poor fella, he wouldn't want to hurt me. He's out of his mind. Well, he's probably got a family somewhere. And as he started towards me, just before coming in the meeting, I led two little policemen to Christ back in the dressing room. They rushed out to get him. Now, that's the police force. Many people's call, that's authentic. We have to be before it's put in the magazine. So he, the police rushed out to get him. I said, no, don't, leave him alone. This is a flat, not a flesh and blood, this is a spiritual affair. They just tucked their hats off and walked back. He walked up towards me. He said, tonight I'm gonna break every bone in your body. I had to look up to see him. I thought, poor fella, never said a word. He went, Spit right in my face and flew all over me. I thought, poor fella, he don't mean to do that. He's out of his mind. And he said, tonight I'm going to knock you way out in the middle of that audience. He was well able to do it. Great big arms. And I never said a word. I know better than to say anything. I just stood still. The audience was hushed. I just looking at him. He walked up to me and he drew his great big arm back and started to raise back. And I heard myself speaking to him. And it said, because you have challenged the Spirit of God, tonight you'll fall over my feet. He said, fall over your feet, you low down hypocrite. He said, I'll show you whose feet I'll fall over. And he drew his big fist back to strike me. I said, Satan, come out of the man. And he threw his hands up in the air, paralyzed him. Went, ah, ah, turned around two or three times and fell across my feet till the policeman had to roll him off of my feet. What was it? Strength? It was love that did it. Congressman Upshaw. 
Here there was a great man right here sitting here at war crutches for a long time, the congressman of the United States Congress, sitting here, Mr. Upshaw, has sat here with a cripple for many, many years, 66 years injured. And here he is tonight without his crutches, without his chair, without anything, walking just as normally. The Holy Spirit is true. God bless. That's him with his hands up with some of you. I've never seen him. That's him here. How many ever seen, never seen Congressman Upshaw, the congressman? Let's see you raise your hands. There. Well, he was in England for 66 years. He fell. And while standing here on the platform when I walked up, eternal God who is my judge knows I never seen or heard of the man in my life. Not knowing I'm uneducated. If I'd had any education, I would have known this man. If I'd been in libraries and read books, and uh, he'd run for president, I think, in 1926. And he, and a great man from Georgia, but I never knew him. And one night I walked into the platform here. Mr. Baxter just left the platform. I look hanging right out here, and I seen the White House, seen all about it, begin to speak, and I couldn't tell. And I told Mr. Baxter, in a few moments it fell, and I seen where the man was sitting. I seen it was him, seen him get hurt when he was just a little boy. And he had been a cripple for all. And I started to leave, and uh, the Spirit of God began to fall, and a woman had raised out of a wheelchair, and some more things had taken place where the Holy Spirit revealing to them. And as I started, Mr. Cop here, the Brother Cop, the pastor, went up there, and I said, Go tell the congressman that God has healed him. I seen him going walking away. Here, would you stand up, congressman, just so the people could see it? Here he is. Uh, the congressman of the United States of America that was a cripple for 66 years. Let us say, bless the Lord. God bless you, my brother. <laughs>
Or is there one Bible on my ship? See, you've waited a long time to think about that. But God's full of mercy, grace. And they found a boy that they'd picked up on the ship. And he had a Bible. And he told him, he said, Come in, son, and sit down by my bed and read me that Bible. And the young lad turned to Isaiah 53, 5, and it reads like this. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. The little boy turned, and he said, Captain, sir. He said, Yes, lad. He said, Let me read it the way my mama used to read it to me. He said, I read you the way it's wrote in the Bible. But here's the way that mama used to read it to me. He said, Go ahead, son, read it the way your mother read it. He said, Mama used to set me up on her knee and read, He was wounded for Willie Pruitt's. He was bruised for Willie Pruitt's iniquity. The chastisement of Willie Pruitt's peace was up on him, and with his stripes, Willie Pruitt was healed. Old captain said, I wish that I had a mama like that. Said, maybe my name could be read into it. Little boy said, just a minute, captain. He said, let me read your name in it. Said, he was wounded for John Court's salvation. <laughs> Amen. He was bruised for John Court's iniquity. The chastisement of John Court's peace was upon him. And with his stripes, John Court was healed. Light flashed over the old captain's face. He said, close the book, son. I see it. When you can read your name in there. He was wounded for William Branham's transgressions. He was bruised for William Branham's iniquity. That's when peace comes. Not just that it was just a wholesale affair. It was for me. It's an individual. I was included in that. With his stripes, William Branham was healed. Then it's different. The Old Mexican Man. The next night, when they lined up and they laid old blankets and coats till they were ricked up nearly four foot high. How they ever know which one more, I don't know. And as they come up to the platform, there was an old Mexican man. He was blind. And when he got up there, he took out a little beads and began to say, Hail Mary, Mother of God. I took his hand, I said, that's not necessary, Dad. The interpreter, Espinosa's interpreted and he was blind I said I'll pray for you and just as I started to pray for him I looked down and he was barefooted his clothes were dirty and dusty his face was wrinkled and his cheeks need shaving the tears were rolling down his old wrinkled cheeks he had his hands out like this hollering Padre Padre I looked at his hands I took his hands and laid him over my shoulder. I looked at his face. And somehow, you have to enter into his feeling. I thought how cruel life has been to the old fellow. Maybe he never had a pair of shoes in his life. I set my foot upside of his to see if my shoe would fit him. It wouldn't. I put my shoulders upside of his to see if my coat would fit him. And it wouldn't. I thought, there he is, maybe never sat down to a good full meal in his life. And he never had a good, decent suit of clothes on in his life. Maybe raised a bunch of little children. And besides all that, now here he is in gross darkness, blind, staggering around. I thought if my old daddy would have lived, he'd have been about that age. Something happened. My heart went out for him. There you are. You've got to get into the fellowship of these people. 
And I took him up my arms around him and I said, Heavenly Father, please be merciful to this poor blind man. He began to holler, Glory adios, Glory adios, it means glory to God. I turned him loose and he run down the platform kissing everybody. Could see as good as I can or you can. What was it? It was entering into divine fellowship of his suffering. King Greece. Long ago, we used to live in a little, when I was a boy, I lived in a little bitty old cabin, and they had just a loft upstairs. Had one bed downstairs, and Papa and Mama slept on that. And there's four of us children at that time, and we had a, a like a straw tick laying down with a, a feather tick laying on top of that. And then Mama used to take and put blankets over us at night and all the coats. And then she'd take a big piece of canvas and stretch over the top of us because great big cracks in the side of the wall and old clapboard shingles was almost off the house. And when it would snow or rain, we'd get wet. And we little Branhams would have to duck our heads under that piece of canvas like a rabbit going under a brush pile when it start raining or something. And we were, and at nighttime sometime, the draft through there would give us cold. And Mama would holler at morning, I could hear her say, Oh, Billy, get up and come on down. You got to get ready to go to school. You and Edward, come on. The little fellows could sleep later. And I'd try to get my eyes open, and my eyes would be stuck together. And I'd say, Mama, I can't see. And she'd say, Oh, you got matter in them. What was the matter? The draft crossing this way had give us cold in her eyes. And we couldn't see that it would swell up during the night and we couldn't see because it was all matter over. And Mama, the cure all around our house was a little cup of coon grease. Mama, Grandpa was a trapper and hunter. I come from a line of hunters. My mother's mother uh, come off the reservations, Cherokee Indian and Tennessee. And when... Uh, Grandpa would catch these coons while they would they would render the grease out of them before they eat them, and then this grease was almost a a cure all around our house. Oh, it was good for the croup at night with turpentine on it or a little coal oil, and then they rubbed it on her chest for a massage when we had asafidity hanging on it also, and it was to keep the coal away and then a. Papa's shoes begin to leak in the snow while they put the coon grease on the stove and fix his shoes. It was almost a cure-all. It worked somehow. I don't know. But Mom would say to us, just a minute till I get the coon grease on the stove. And she'd get a, the old tin cup and set the coon grease on the stove and get it warm and come up and massage her eyes with it until our eyes come open. It worked. I don't know how, but... We, our eyes got open. Well, brother, I'll tell you, the coon grease might have worked all right for that kind of a natural sight. But we've had a great cold spell in the church. And I'm afraid somebody's got some spiritual coldness in their eyes. It'll take more than coon grease to get it out. That's right. But God said, counsel to me, I've got some eye salve for you. I can open that eye door to you. I'll open your eyes. Now, what is salve? It's oil. It's hardened. Well, that's what the grease that God has for your eyes is oil. And oil is the Holy Spirit in the Bible. Indian God. I had a story that was told me some time ago. I might have told it in this church. If I have, you forgive me for repeating it just to hit the spot. There was an Indian guide our kind of a overseer of the Indians. He was traveling in the Navajo country and was got lost. His name was Coy. And he uh, was going down a trail, a game trail. And uh, he thought, now if I hit this trail, I'll surely find water. And his horse was so thirsty till its tongue was hanging out dry. The nostrils had turned red and caked with sand. He had held his handkerchief over his face 
in the sandstorms until it would caked over and he was perishing for water. And he was leading his horse when he struck the trail. And he said, when he got on the horse, he saw this game trail, said, surely it'll take me to water. So he jumps the straddle of his horse and started down the trail and the horse knew also it was on the trail to water. How God gives instinct to the dumb beast. And down the trail it went. Finally, a few turned off to one side, just a very few off the beaten path. The horse wanted to turn that way, but Coy thought different. He tried to keep it in the main blaze trail, and he started down, and the horse would not go. He spurred it, and it nickered and started the other way, and it started rearing up. She's too weak to buck him off. So he started pouring the spurs to it again until he cut the horse so excited to get the water, his life would be spared until the horse stood quivering, bleeding. And he looked down, looked down there, and she's quivering like that, almost falling under him. He looked down at her, seen the blood on her side. He was a Christian. And he said to his horse, he said, I've often heard that while our beast had an instinct, it don't look like that that little bitty bunch turned off that way would be going to water. It looks like this great path here would lead to where they go constantly to water. But said, if you've carried me faithful this far, I'll follow your instinct. Oh, how I think of that about Christ. The way to destruction is posted and blazed all the way. But there's a narrow road that leads to life. Few there will be to find it. Only not instinct, but the Holy Spirit will turn you aside to that water of life. I think it's brought me safe this far. I'll take it the rest of the way. To finish the story, he, he hadn't gone a half a mile until all at once the faithful horse plunged right into a big hole of water. The horse knew what it was talking about, what it was meaning in its way of expressing to the, the rider. He got in there. He said he threw water up into the horse's nose. He bathed himself. He screamed and he hollered. He was shouting to the top of his voice and pouring water down his throat and screaming, We're saved, we're saved, we're saved. And the horse drinking and quivering, and he looked at her bloody sides then all whelped up from the spur marks, and said just then, he said, heard somebody say, Come out of the water. And he looked, and there was a little disfigured cowboy standing there. And he got out of the water. He said, He smelt fire, and he looked over, and there's a bunch of men camping there. They'd been up on a prospecting outfit. They struck some gold. And on the road back, they had their horses and pack horses along. And they'd come to this water hole and was resting. And they'd all got drunk. And said they had some venison cooking. And he did eat with them and said, one of them said, take a drink. He told them who he was. He was Jack Coy, the, the um, Indian guide. So he said, well, now, take a drink. He said, no. He said, I don't drink. And that's kind of an insult to them people. So he said, you'll take a drink from us. He said, no, I don't drink. So he threw the jug up and said, take a drink. Drunk all of them, you know, about a half a dozen. And so he said, thank you, boys. said, if our venison's good enough to eat, our whiskey's good enough to drink. And you know how they are, drunk. And he said, no. He said, and uh, they threw a shell in the rifle. And said, now you'll drink or else. He said, no, no. I won't drink. And he started to aim the rifle. He said, just a moment. He said, I'm not afraid to die. He said, I I'm not afraid to die. He said, but I, I want to tell you my story for you, the reason I don't drink. He said, I'm a Kentuckian. He said, and in a little old log cabin one morning where a mother lay dying, she called me to her bedside and said, Jack, your father died with a deck of cards in his hand across a table drunk. And said, don't ever drink, Jack, whatever you do. And said, on my mother's brow, I laid my hands. And I promised God as a little 10-year-old boy, I would never take my first drink. He said, I've never took it. And said, now, if you want to shoot, you just shoot. And as a drunk raised his rifle and threw the jug up again, said, take it or I'll shoot. And just then, a gun fired and the jug bursted. Standing at the side of a canyon was a little old cowboy, disfigured, 
the tears running down his cheeks. He said, Jack, I too come from Kentucky. I made a promise to a mother one day, but I broke my promise. He said, I was waiting till these guys got drunk enough and it's going to kill a whole bunch of them anyhow and take what gold they had. He said, but I've been a drunk and I've done wrong, but said, I'm sure when my gun echoed up through the canyons of heaven, mother heard me sign a pledge I'll never do it again. There, by the grace of God, he led all those people to Christ, all those out there. Robin's Red Breast. And uh, most boys throw rocks at birds. But I imagine these two sitting here on the front seat wouldn't throw rocks at birds. <laughs> no, sir. And be sure not to throw rocks at my little robins, you see. Uh, robin is my bird. Did you ever see him with the red breast? You know how they got red? I tell you. So you won't throw no rocks at him. One day there was a man dying on a cross. Everybody had left him. His hands was nailed in the cross, the briny tears and the blood running from his face, spinning down over his body, and he was nailed there. And a little bird, a little brown bird, felt so sorry for him, he kept flying into his hands and trying to pull the nails out, flying into his feet and trying to pull the nails out. You know what happened? He got his little breast all red with blood, and since then he's had a red breast. You don't want to throw no rocks at him, do you? No, no. The snake bite. I remember very well first time seeing Brother Evans. A brother Mercer said, there's a man wants to meet you in the morning I was in Philadelphia and when it had taken place. And when I was getting up out of the bed, I saw the man. And he's kind of a sportsman, likes to fish. And I saw him doing a violation. <laughs> so the morning when I met him, I told Media about it. She said, you wouldn't say that to that strange man. I said, I'll find out what he is first. So then, after talking to him, seeing he was just a real fella, I said, um, say, just recently, you was on a fishing trip back in like Nebio. You had a whole sack full of fish, and you had to hide them three times to keep away from the game warden. Looking, he said, yes, sir. I, I, well, well, he's going to what I was going to say. I said, there's just one request. Will you take me fishing back there? <laughs> his brother had been bitten by a snake back there which is a ground rattler I don't know if they have him here in Louisiana or not and he's a nasty little thing and uh, that boy had hospitalized he's not a Christian young, a little younger brother Evans here and he had to have a brace on his leg walked on a hook months and so right back in the same place you know, the Lord kind of told me to go back there, and I, I caught some of the finest bass. <laughs> oh, my, great big fellas. And I had one great big one hooked on, trying to get him out with a bumblebee popper, you know. And so, and he was so big, his mouth about like that, and that little bumblebee in there, he'd stand right up on his tail, you fishermen know, and he'd flip that thing out, and you just have to hold it. If you don't, you pull it out, and kind of hard. He was angry, and I throw it back and had him on three or four times. He'd have been a 12, 14 pound fish. So, Brother Evans, see me, and Oh, he's just a good country boy, you know, had his trouser legs rolled up because he'd gotten wet. And so he said, he must be old Big Jim. I said, he sure must. So I threw out again, and I, I got one. I said, that's him. I said, no, I'm not quite him. He's nice, fast. And we carried little pistols on our hips because you had to fight your way through alligators and, and cotton mouths to get in there, this swamp 17,000 acres in this ranch and it's been a dredge line went through that years ago and that's where we was fishing and so we had to wade through water and everything to get in there and gators snakes just some wads and so uh, we'd take pole move around if we see a ground rattler just shoot him and then just walk on in the water see so keep on going because he'd be laying on top of the lily or something coiled ready to strike so Brother Wells said I'll pick him up your fish and he jumped off in some little toolies and pads there and when he did a ground rattler grabbed him just about all oh, about a half a mile from where his brother had got it bitten well he jumped out of the water there with two holes in his leg foot just above like that where the snake fang had hit and he said his bones is freezing in him now if you've seen his size he's lots bigger than I am now I'd have to pack him about 
two miles on my back to get him out of there. That was too much for me. And we just sat there and holding it, suffering. And the Lord just spoke to me, said a scripture, they shall tread on the heads of serpents and scarpins. Nothing shall defy, harm them. I said, just a minute, Brother Evans. I put my hand over on the snake bite on his foot. I said, Heavenly Father, we're in a state of emergency. And it is written that they should take up serpents or if they tread on the heads, it will not harm them. That was for believers, and this brother is a believer. And I'm a believer. And we ask for your mercy. He stopped kind of breathing and suffering the way he was. And I thought he's just in respect to the prayer. When I got finished, he was laughing. <laughs> but all the pain's gone. Just put on his shoes and went on. At 11 o'clock that night, they were out there taking pictures when we got to the place where we were staying, the motel, come back out of the ranch. His brother runs a bait shop then, just across the street. Well, he's over there taking pictures of these big strings, uh, of these big large mouth bass. And so he said, uh, while we were, while we were standing there, the story came up about the snake bite. <laughs> His brother said, it's good to be religious, but not good to be foolish. He said, he said you better get the medical aid right now. See, because he was on a hook from the same kind of a bite. He said, I was bitten this morning about 11 o'clock. This is 11 o'clock this afternoon. The God that could protect me this long can protect me the rest of the way through. So. There he is. See, he still, he still protects from snake bites. <laughs> See, his sinner brother, fine boy, we're working on him to get him to be a Christian. Now, the sinner went to the hospital, same blood, same boy, brothers, went to the hospital, laid hospitalized, a hoop around his leg, walked on it for a long time, and the Christian, the believer, stepped right on the same kind of a snake and never bothered him a bit. God bless you, Brother Evan. Jeffersonville Fire Department. A great uh, fire broke loose down in Jeffersonville here not long ago. The foul army of the uh, company uh, began to burn down, and they sent and got the fire department. And the Jeffersonville fire department standing around there like a boy with a little hose. The chief walking around there with a cigar like a dehorned Texas steer, walking around there saying, Spurt a little water up here. Spurt a little water up here, boys. Come on, come on. Everybody see you as chief. Spurt a little water up here. Well, they said, we've got to get another fire department. He, they, it was sufficient. Sent out Clarksville. Here they come, bang, bang, bang. Got up there and that chief walked out. Shook hands with that chief, doing honor one to another. And how can you have faith when you have no. honor to one another? Some great man, bishop, great big guy, presbyter, nothing. We are brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. There's nothing big among us. It's what's in us that's big. God, the Holy Ghost, every one of us who believes. No great holy bishops and holy fathers. It's the Holy Ghost. It's in the people. Yes. So along come this Clarksville Fire Department. Hey, good evening, Bishop. And <laughs> yes, like that. Uh, building burnt right on down. After a while, they called Louisville. Brother, they had something, man. I can stand there now and see that old hook and ladder coming across there. And I'm going along there saying, break out that window, spurt a little water in there. When the Louisville big trained army of fighters come up there, they swirl that truck around there in the street, brother. They cleaned off half the sidewalk when they turned. Who was at the end of the ladder? They had a power lift that towed it up. Who was on the end of the ladder? The fire chief himself. Hey, Amen. When they, he had the hose in his hand and the axe in the other hand, the letter go, and they pull that lever. Who went first? The fire chief. When it hit up against the wall, he took that axe before the ladder got against the wall and slammed it through the window and said, Come on, boys! Yeah. Uh, Not on, boys! Come on, boys! Amen. Hallelujah! That's what Christ done! The Word come, lived as a human, conquered death, hell, grave. Never said, Go on. He said, Come on, I'm with you. Amen. The fire was out pretty soon. The swimming hole.
When I was a little boy, we used to run swimming, and they would, we would dare each other as we run to the old swimming hole. And um, the last one into the water had a penalty, had to get mud thrown on him. I was usually the first one in because I had less clothes than the rest of them. I just had a pair of overhauls with the fodder twine wrapped around them with a nail for a button. Does anybody ever know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Thank you. Only thing I had to do is pull one string and I was ready for the water. <laughs> <laughs> And then we had a signal, and when the, if the water was cold, we held up one finger, the first one in. Be careful coming in, it's too cold. If it was good, we held up two fingers. If it was all right, jump in. Come on. <laughs> it's all right, let's jump in. This is, this is good. The water's warm and ready. Three squirrels. And that scripture stumped me all my life, sitting there that morning in the woods. And I was thinking on that, and that boy spoke to me. He said that scripture is like all scriptures, is true. And I thought, well, how could it be? And he said, you're, I said, he said, speak and it will be that way, don't doubt it. And I was talking to somebody sitting out in the woods, no squirrels, been there for three days. There's no squirrels there. And I sat in a sycamore thicket. Squirrels don't even come. Anyone hunts squirrels? Well, they're not in Sycamore. And I've been sitting there, wind blowing real hard about 10 o'clock in the morning. And I was thinking again, and he said, you're hunting. And you need squirrels just the same as Abraham needed a ram. Well, I thought that's always told me the truth. But this sounds funny. And I got up from where I was sitting, looked all around. Where is that person that was talking to me? Nothing. Wind just blowing real hard. I thought, could I have fell asleep and dream that? No, I wasn't asleep. I was sitting up against a tree there, watching. I supposed to pick up Brother Woods and Brother Sopman back there. Just a little bit, around 10 o'clock in the morning. Farmers all out there working, gathering their corn. I heard it again, say, you are hunting and you need game. How many do you need? And I thought, now I don't want to overdo this. I'm just going to ask for three. Three squirrels. I want young three red squirrels. I want them. He said, then speak about it. And I said, I am going to get three young red squirrels. He said, which way will they come? Well, I thought I went this far. There's something talking to me here, just the same as you hear me talking. God in heaven, this Bible over my heart, knows that that's true. And he... And I said, well, I picked out a ridiculous place, an old dry limb hanging out there about 50 yards where my rifle was shot in. I said, the first one will be right there. And there he was. I rubbed my eyes and looked back. I turned my head and I thought, I don't want to shoot a vision. So I looked around again and there sat the squirrel. I threw a shell up in my gun, aimed up, and I could see his black eye, young red squirrel. I thought, uh, I, maybe I'm asleep and I'll wake up in a few minutes. See, I'm dreaming about this. Well, I leveled down, shot the squirrel, and it dropped off the limb. I thought, well, I don't know. I thought, should I go over and look for it? And I walked over there, and there it laid. I picked it up, and blood ran out of it. A vision don't bleed, you know. So I picked it up, and it was a squirrel. I got real numb all over. And I looked around, and I said, God, that was you. I said, thank you for this. Now I'll go out. He said, but you said. Do you doubt what you said? You said you'd get three. Now where will the next one come from? I thought, well, if I'm dreaming, I'm going to continue on. So I, I said, I picked out a, an old post over there of a tree that's all wrapped up with this year uh, poison ivy. You ever get a squirrel in that? So I said, the next one will come right out of that poison ivy, and there sat that young red squirrel looking right at me. I set my gun down, rubbed my eyes, and turned around again, I thought, there he sat, turned his head sideways. I shot the squirrel. And then I started to go home. 
But said you said three. Do you doubt what you said? I said, no, Lord, I don't doubt what I said. For you're confirming this is one scripture that stumped me. Not if I say, but if you say. Not if Jesus said it, but if you say it yourself. And I thought somehow I broke into that channel. And I know he's here because I'm almost beside myself. I thought I'll make this one ridiculous sure enough. I said, there'll be a red squirrel. Come down off that hill. Come right down this way and right by me. And go out and sit on that limb and look down there at that farmer. Here he come down the hill. Went right out and sat looking at the farmer. And I shot him. Satan said to me, you know what? The woods are just full of them now. And I sat there till 12 o'clock and not another thing happened. It goes to show that when God, he's the very creator of heavens and earth. Turtle on fire. When I was a little boy, my brother and I, we went out one time, we seen an old terrapin turtle. We Indiana people know what they are. Walk funny, and we little kids, we thought, say, that's a funny-looking thing. So I said, let's go to him. And as soon as he got up to him, he pulled himself back in a hole. Puts him in the mind when you really go to put the gospel down. How <laughs> oh, them old mossbacks get back into that hole. Oh, don't believe it. These are miracles just passing. Oh, it is. So I said, I'll, I'll fix him. I went and got me a long switch and cut it off, poured it on him. That didn't do no good. He just laid there. You can't beat it into him. That's right. Right. I said, I'll fix him. I took him down to the creek. Uh, put him down in the creek. Just a few bubbles come up. That was all. Brother, you can baptize him face forward, backward, any way you want to. It don't do a bit of good. Right. You know how I made him walk? I built me a little fire and set the old boy on it. He walked then. That's right. What if Jonah isn't there? As the little girl was coming one day from the tabernacle, she's a little, about like this little snickle fritz last uh, the night or tonight with her hair combed back here, you know, her little, I thought she was cute, a little singer. I don't get, she's bound here. I hope I don't hurt her feeling, but she's real cute. And this little girl had just got saved and she had a Bible over her heart just singing. There's an old infidel lived up the road there in a little city called Utica, Indiana. And he said, um, uh, what are you so happy about this morning? She said, well, I just found Jesus. <laughs> so how do you know you found him? He said, what's that you got in your hand? A prayer book? She said, no, it's a Bible. He said, I guess you believe it. He said, I believe every bit of it. And he said, do you believe that story in there about uh, Jonah and the whale? She said, yes, sir. I believe every word of it. He said, oh, it's not so, honey. Don't you believe that? She said, but I believe it is so. Well, I said... How are you going to prove that it's so outside of faith, as you call it? Well, she said, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jonah. <laughs> so, huh? And the infidel said to the little girl, said, oh, what if Jonah isn't there? Said, then you'll have to ask him. <laughs> so, that's just about to head in. Um, if he wasn't there, they'd know where he was at. So uh, just like it said, if the Bible said that Jonah swallowed the whale, I'd believe it. If the Bible said so. So I believe that all those things are true, every word of it, every phase of the Bible.